Hello everyone, my name is Dave Casuto, instructor for Learn It, and welcome to the intro to Photoshop class. What will you learn, you ask? Well, we are going to just start from the basics, creating a new document, move to basic image manipulation, working with layers, type and topography, and move all the way up to color correction techniques, creating masks, using filters, and so much more. Now, this course is designed to be interactive and a hands-on course. So occasionally you'll hear me say things like, pause the video and practice on your own. So make sure you download the class files from the link below to do so. This will ensure you get the most out of the course and learn the program in a more experiential, hands-on manner. I'm looking forward to teaching you all the cool things that Photoshop has to offer. So stay tuned and get ready to learn. If you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe. If you want to earn certificates and digital badges, please become a member of our Patreon. The link is in our video description. If you have any questions you want answered by one of our instructors, please join our off-site community. The link is in the description as well. And as I mentioned, this course does have exercise files and you'll find them in the video description below. Welcome back everyone. I am using the icelandpostcard.psd file, so please have that open so you can follow along. So in this lesson, we're gonna be learning how we can customize the workspace, how we can learn about the workspace in Photoshop, essentially understand the anatomy and some of the terminology around Photoshop. Now, everything I'm going to show you is the same for both the PC and the Mac, so no need to worry there if you're on a different operating system than me. Okay, so currently I'm looking at the workspace called the Essentials Workspace. Now let's go ahead and take a look how we can identify what that is and how we can also change that. So if you'll notice over here in the far, far upper left, I have this little drop down menu. This little drop down menu tells me that I'm in the Essentials Workspace. So if you're not currently, you can go ahead and change that and then go ahead and click on Reset Essentials and then I'm back to that. So let's go ahead and just start cracking away and making some changes to this to make it look a little bit more user friendly for us. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this little guy way up here to make my tools panel two columns. And you're gonna see that's gonna be a lot easier to read. You're gonna see that Photoshop also sections things out in a little more intuitive way when you have it in two columns. It's gonna be the first change I'm gonna make. The next change I'm gonna make has to do with which panels do I want, right? I have my colors panel, I have my swatches, right? I got all these things here, right? I got channels, I got paths, all these things here. Some of these I don't want. So very simply, all we do is right click on the panel we do not want, choose close. Right click, patterns, close. Not working with channels right now, not working with paths, right click. Now you will notice that when you right click, you get other options as well, like you can minimize. Oh, that's kind of nice, right? So layers now gets minimized. So I can right click and I can go ahead and expand it. That's kind of nice. Also note that I can move these panels around just the same. So if I want layers just kind of floating here, I can absolutely do that. It's a very simple click and drag. And there we go. I can also expand this out to make it taller, to make it shorter. I can even make it wider. Very kind of delicate there. There you go. Just make sure you find that little double-sided arrow and you're good to go. Now you're also going to see some times where there are panels that you want to use that are not shown here. So all of our panels live in one particular place and that is the window menu. And again, this is the same thing for if you're on a PC or if you're on a Mac. So if I click on window, you'll see in alphabetical order, I have all of the panels available to me. So for example, if I want to bring out my character panel, I click on that and then notice that the character panel appears along with the paragraph panel as a little bonus. And then you'll notice that a new column now appears for all of your other additional panels if you'd like to bring them in. So I'm just gonna go ahead and collapse that. You'll notice I can very easily access it, expand it and collapse it. Very nice. And of course I can drag that out just like I did with my layers panel. Another nice little pro tip is if you double click on the layer name, excuse me, on the panel name, you can see, very good. If you double click on that, it comes right up. Expand, collapse, expand, collapse. You'll also notice that there's a little X there if you want to as well. Now, if I wanna move this back to where it was, you'll see I have a few different options here. 
Keep an eye on the blue halo as soon as I sort of touch ground here. You'll notice that when I move to here, I get a little blue halo, little blue halo, little blue halo. Wherever that blue halo is, is where this panel is gonna live. I'm gonna drag mine way down to the bottom and you're gonna see a tiny little blue halo way in the bottom and lo and behold, that is where my panel lives, right there at the bottom. So I love exactly what I've done here, okay? I love this, I'm gonna keep this all set up and I wanna save this as my own. So what I'm gonna do is click on the little drop down where I started from and I'm gonna choose new workspace, right? Click on that and you're gonna see here, I can name it. Okay, I'm gonna say Dave's Faves, wonderful. And then just click on these boxes to make sure it's basically freezing everything. This is the workspace I want. I'm overriding the essentials. So I click on save. And now when I click on the drop down again, you will see there's Dave's Faves, wonderful. And then anytime I mess anything up, right, I go a little bit crazy. Let's say I delete some things. I can always come back to that. That's what's so great about this. I like to call this kind of like the Mary Poppins effect, where it just sort of like cleans up your mess, right? Let me just go ahead and make this even more messy so you kind of get the effect. Okay, wow, what a disaster, madman at work. I click on the drop down, and then all I'm gonna do now is say, reset Dave's faves, and then I'm back. Okay, and now that I am done customizing my workspace, I recommend getting yours to look like mine, creating your own workspace, and naming it accordingly. In this next lesson, we're gonna learn about some of the basics of understanding what some of our panels do, but also we can get our hands dirty with resizing some of our photos, moving them around, rotating, essentially kind of creating something like this and how this is more or less done. So first thing we wanna identify is on the left-hand side, we have our tools, right? And we're going to be working with this initial tool called the move tool. So let's go ahead and activate that if it's not activated already. And I want to make sure that you have both the show transform tools box and the auto select box selected. For some of you it may look a little different. It might look like icons. Just make sure that they're selected. Why are we doing this? If I click on that, I want to actually see the, sh the show transform tools. I want to be able to auto select the layer. Earlier, we talked about the layers panel. Here is my layers panel. You can see when I click on it, my layers then act accordingly. Very important because it'll kind of keep you in the dark otherwise. Okay, And by default, these are not activated. So let's make sure that those are in fact selected. So I'm also going to drag out my layers panel like I showed you in the earlier lesson. So that way I can have easier access to it if, if necessary. Now in my layers panel, this will be our first introduction to the layers panel. You will see that I have some names for my layers panel and notice I also have the ordering of things. It's gonna become very important as we move throughout this class. So let's work on our first lesson of resizing and also rotating some of our items that we have here on our canvas. So when I click on this, you'll notice how I get a little bounding box. You'll also notice that I have my tools up on top here as well, all my different individual controls. If that's not there, if you click on Window, you'll see that I have this options option that comes and goes, right? As I click on that, so I'm gonna bring that back. Fantastic, okay, so if yours is not there, you can always go to Window. Just like I said, that's where all of your panels live. Fantastic, so now I see that there, and when I click and drag on this corner, I'll be able to resize that accordingly. But notice when I kind of do this or I kind of do that, not so great. So what I'm gonna do is either click on this little circle slash to reset it. Also notice that there's a little tool tip that pops up that says, oh, I can also hit escape in parentheses. That's what I'm gonna do. And that sets us right back. So what a good rule of thumb for you to do is, is if you hold down the shift key as you click and drag, it keeps it in proportion. It constrains your proportions as you click and drag on the corners. You can sometimes do the sides if you want to, but that will stretch it out or make it a little bit too narrow. So just keep that in mind, okay? Also notice that as the name implies, with the move tool, I can move this wherever I want because it's its own individual layer. That's essentially how Photoshop works. So I can move this around independent of this, and I could just basically shuffle these around accordingly, no problem, okay? But now let's say I wanted to rotate these in a different way. If you'll notice here on the outside, 
I'm gonna move my mouse away from the double-sided arrow and I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna get this kind of little button hook. See that? Just go ahead and click and drag and then it'll move accordingly. And then when I'm done transforming, very important here, you have to tell Photoshop that you're done transforming. This is known as transformation. So right now, if I try to do something, everything gets grayed out. Like a lot of things get grayed out as a result. I have to tell Photoshop that I'm done doing what I'm doing. Earlier, we discussed how we can work with the little circle slash to tell it, no thanks, I don't commit. Connected to that is this little check mark to say, yes, I do commit. So I have two options here. I can click on the checkbox or I can hit enter on my keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on the checkbox for now and then I've committed to that and that's done official. So I click on this, I'm gonna go ahead now and rotate that one, no problem. This time I'm gonna hit the enter key and that is committed. It's that easy. Now that we've seen how we can manipulate something that already exists, let's learn how we can create this from scratch. So how is that done? Like a lot of other programs, we start with the file menu and we just choose new. And you'll also notice we have control. And if you're on a Mac, it's going to be command N. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I'm going to essentially teach you how we can create the same thing that we see here on this screen. So this is what it looks like when you are creating a brand new document in Photoshop. So essentially, they give you a number of different options on top, right? Some preset templates if you want to, if you're working on photos, right? They give you a whole bunch of different templates, prints, different templates, art and illustration, right? And you can see that not only are they giving you different dimensions, but they're also giving you places to start with, right? Kind of nice if you're doing like a web layout, etc. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and create my own, and I'm going to show you how you can even create your own saved layout as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead over here on the right hand side and decide what I'm going to put in, which is gonna be an 11 inches by eight and a half inches document, and it's going to be landscape. So you'll notice here I can change the orientation. And then my resolution, this is gonna be very important. Resolution is basically how vivid is this going to be? How rich is this going to be? Are you gonna be printing it? Or are you gonna be putting it on the web? Typically, if you're gonna be printing it, you wanna be at least 300 PPI. If you're gonna be putting it on the web, you can settle at 72 PPI. Okay, typically you don't want it to be too high if you're gonna be putting it on the web, essentially for load times. You'll also notice down below, I have my color mode option, I have RGB, and I have my CMYK. Those are gonna be the two ones we're gonna be focusing on. This stands for red, green, and blue color, and that's typically gonna be for the web because that's how your screen reads your images. CMYK is typically gonna be for print, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So it really all depends because your printer, like literally the printing machine itself, can only read these colors. So it's very important that we understand what are we generating the document for. And over here we have our 8-bit and our 16-bit. And if we go over here to RGB, it'll say 18-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit. Just really depends on how many colors you're expecting each of your documents to have like 16,000 colors, 28,000 colors. And if you're gonna go up to 32 bit, that's gonna be an HDR document. So let's just go ahead and make our 16 bit. And what is gonna be the background of your document as you create it? You can actually make it black, white. You can set all these things up ahead of time if you'd like. I'm just gonna keep mine at transparent. Okay, and we're just gonna keep this for right now. And then I'm going to also click on this little guy right here. What is this one about? This is gonna allow me to save this as a preset. So therefore, I don't have to do this anymore. Okay, I don't have to set all these things up. So now when I click on that, I'm gonna be able to save this as a preset. I'll just go ahead and say 11 by eight and a half landscape. All right, and then I'll just say 72 PPI, fantastic. Click on save preset and now look under saved i will see there that is and anytime i want to use it i'll be able to come back to here and won't have to reset all these things okay so i'm going to go ahead and click create and now i have a blank document all ready to go great 
Now let's start building out our document. Now that we have this all set up, you will see I have an empty layers panel. Great. We also notice that all my panels have remained the same. It's great. This is exactly how I want it. So our first lesson when we're bringing in things from the outside is going to be placing, placing, not pasting, not importing. Photoshop and a lot of other Adobe programs refers to this as placing. So placing essentially means we're bringing in some items from the outside. And in this case, the item we're bringing in is going to be one of those images, right? Of the RAM and of the iceberg, etc. So I click on file. You'll see here I have two options, either to place embedded or to place linked. When you're placing linked, essentially implies that there might be some changes happening to that file and you want to kind of have that linked up essentially. So if I'm working with a coworker and they're making some changes, it automatically gets updated here on my file. We're just going to do place embedded. So it's just going to be static right here inside of this document. So I click on that and I'm going to go to my files. Okay. And I'm going to go over to here to all my little friends here. I'm going to bring in the big iceberg. I simply just click on that and that's going to come in. And again, you'll notice I have my little bounding box, which is great. I also have my little circle slash and I also have my little check mark there. Okay. And I'm just going to go ahead and resize that however I want to holding down my shift key and rotating accordingly. And then I'm going to hit enter when I'm done. So I'm going to very quickly do the other two place embedded, bring in my Ram, hold down my shift key, constraining the proportions, hit enter. Don't forget that hitting enter part. Very important. You'll learn that fast enough anyway. And now let's go to our medium iceberg and just bring that down. Holding down my shift key. Great. And then this time I'll just hit the check mark in case that's your fancy. Great. Now, now that I have these, let's see what we can do about some initial layer management. Okay, you'll see that it takes in the name of the actual document that I started with. Okay, that's great. So maybe I don't necessarily want that exact same thing. So I can just simply double click on that. And then I will just say instead, this is going to be iceberg one. Okay, and this is going to be iceberg two. Okay, very easily, just simply double click. All right. And there we go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and I'm going to have you catch up and do all the things that we did in terms of placing, resizing, rotating, etc. Okay, we'll come back to you and good luck. Welcome back, everyone. So in this document, you will notice that around all of our images, we have these little checkerboards here. These checkerboards indicate what? Tells me that my image is transparent. So if I were to bring in this image and save this transparency, and I would bring it into, let's say, a PowerPoint document, it would just kind of float with whatever that PowerPoint document's background is. So it would not come in with its own background. It would just kind of float there. Kind of nice. So we're going to learn a little bit of how we can either change the background to make it our own, but then when we save our document, how we can retain this transparency. Now, what we need to do first is discuss a little bit about the layers panel. Okay, so right now I have my layers panel over here on the right hand side. You'll see this whole thing is my layers panel and we have a number of different icons down below. We also have this little guy over here, right? And earlier we discussed that little guy right there. Okay. And of course here is the name of the panel. Okay. Now each of these things has a purpose and you'll also notice that other panels also have kind of some similar things like a little flyout menu and things like that. Once we bring it out, you'll see more options here. And as we go throughout this course, we will be discovering much, much more detail than what we're going to discover right now. Earlier, we looked at how we can rename each of our layers. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, you will also see that in this panel, we'll be able to see a bunch of other things that's going to allow us to have controls of our panels. 
What we're going to look at right now is how we can adjust this background here. You'll notice that currently, again, it is transparent. So what can I do to add on a colored background? You'll notice this little guy right here, this little black and white cookie. When you click on that, you're going to see a lot of options. And again, this is going to be for some more advanced features. When we get into our adjustment layers, we're going to see all those. What we're concerned with right now is just adding on a solid color. Okay, when you move your mouse over, you will see it is called an adjustment layer. So the adjustment we're making is going to be a solid color. I click on that and then I can just go ahead and choose whatever color I like. We're going to get a lot into colors later on. Just do this nice, pretty aqua blue color. I click OK and then oops, everything gets covered. Why is it getting covered? Because this is the top layer. So very simply, I want to bring it down to the bottom. So all I need to do is just click and drag that down and then just notice follow the blue lines there. I let go and voila, there you go. Now this is behind everything else. Great, and I can go ahead and just double click on this to rename this. I'll just say blue BG and I hit enter. That's great, wonderful. Okay, so I love this. I love this exactly as it is. So I'm gonna save this. If you see my tab here, this now has an untitled Photoshop file here. Uh-oh, I don't want that. So I want to be able to save this. When I save it, it's a good idea to save it not only as like your output, what if it's going to be a JPEG or a PNG or a TIFF or a PDF, but you also want to always save it as your working file, meaning my Photoshop file. So very important. So that's going to be the first thing I'm going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and click on File. I'm going to choose save as and you'll notice here my save as type is going to be psd okay that's great all right so i'm just going to say rams on parade okay great and that's going to be my psd file i'm going to go ahead and click save now why did i do that i want to have a working file because this is going to retain all this layers Okay, very important because I want to be able to make changes to this. So as an example, I can come back now and say, hey, listen, you know what? I want this to be on top. And because I'm working in my Photoshop file, I can now move this above my RAM and now notice what it does. So we're getting a nice little bonus layers lesson here on top of all that. Okay, and you'll be able to practice all this in your practice time. All right, so that's a Photoshop file. Let's now practice saving it as another file type. So I click on File, Save As, and you will see here in this dropdown, I have lots and lots of options to work with, All right? We're gonna focus on two main ones. One is gonna be my JPEG, and the other one is gonna be my PNG. Now, when do we use one versus the other? Let's start with the PNG option. PNG typically is going to be for when you are working with transparencies. Like earlier, we talked about before we had our blue background, I want to retain that transparency, but yet still have high resolution, I would do PNG. If I don't really care about that, because I don't have a transparency that I'm working with, I can just work with a JPEG, right? Which is fine, which is great. And that's essentially what I'm going to do now. And then notice it's save as JPEG. I click on save. And what JPEG gives you the benefit of is being able to compress your file because maybe you're concerned about file size, okay? Whereas PNG gives you a little bit of um, sort of gradation, JPEG gives you quite a bit to be able to really compress it on different levels here, okay? So if I wanna bring this down a little bit more, bring it up a little bit more, absolutely I can do that. And I click okay, and now, it's gonna be a little smaller file size than it would be if it was 12. Okay, so go ahead and practice that. We'll pause the video for a little bit and we'll come back. And lastly, within our layers panel, I wanna talk a little bit of how we can delete layers and then also some additional things that we're gonna be discovering later on. So deleting, pretty simple. So let me go ahead and just open up my group here and I click on this and then notice here I can Delete with the trash can. Okay, you'll also notice that right clicking goes a long way. Lots and lots of options here. Here is delete layer. I can duplicate layer, lots of things here. We're gonna get into rasterizing layers later on. And some of the things we've already done in terms of grouping and everything 
are already here. Okay, so if I want to delete this, I'm just going to go simply click on my little trash can and that goes away. Great, fantastic. But I'm going to undo that by simply clicking on edit and then notice here is undo and then here is also control Z or command Z on the Mac. So that comes right back. Also a very good tool to know about. Okay, so deleting is pretty simple and also again right clicking for lots of additional options and then don't forget to undo when you make a mistake. All right, we'll see you in the next lesson. Now, keeping in line with this same image and document, let's imagine a scenario where we'd like to manipulate the canvas a little bit, meaning maybe I want a little more space on the outside around it, or maybe I want to crop it. So what can I do here? Let me just first of all bring up the ruler. Okay, we're currently working without a ruler. The ruler is very important to have open just so we can have some context of where we are how big our document is, where things are, so we can have some sort of specificity and sort of exactitude. So how do we do that? Let's go to the view menu and we're gonna go to rulers and then bam, pops right up. You'll also notice the keyboard shortcut is just control R and there you go. And now here are my rulers. Now, if you right click on the ruler, you'll be able to see all the different units of measure. So currently this is set to pixels. If I choose inches, you'll see there it is. 11 inches wide. Awesome, and eight and a half inches tall. Wonderful. So it's a good idea to have that. I think for the most part, I like to practice with my ruler for sure. So let's just take a look what we can do now to manipulate our canvas. This whole thing is known as our canvas. So if I go over here to the image menu, see here we are. I'm gonna go over here to my canvas size and you'll see, very good, there it is. But then somebody comes in and says, listen, we're actually gonna do something a little bit bigger now. We actually want to make this 14 by eight and a half. I click OK and then, all right, great. There it is. Now I have a little more space to play with. I can move that around, move that around. Maybe I'm going to move this up a little bit. Maybe I'm going to just, just you can kind of manipulate it nice and easy. OK, so that's kind of a cool thing to know about for sure. You'll also note that inside of this is also your image size. Now, this is talking about the entire document here, just as is. Now, you'll notice that there's a number of different options that we can do here. And I would say that the main thing that you'll be doing is focusing on potentially changing the resolution for some of your images. Earlier, we talked about how when you're creating a new document, the 72 PPI is going to be good for the web. But sometimes you might say, listen, I actually want to make this get kind of upgraded so I can print it. So you may decide that you're going to upgrade that to 300. OK, now there could be some problems with that because it could get stretched out. So you want to choose this option to make sure to resample. And the best choice for you is to choose preserve detail 2.0. OK, so there are a bunch of other options here. This is the newest one. You can see here, here's preserved detail. But this is the latest and greatest technology in terms of basically like upscaling um, for higher resolution if you want to do it. OK, so you want you to notice also when I choose 72, I want you to notice the size of my document. OK, that's great. All right. And when I change this to 300, notice the size now. Okay, it goes all the way up to 30 megabytes. Okay, so just keep that in mind what you're doing as you're doing this, but also take care to look at the resolution as you're doing it as well. Okay, to make sure that the quality um, isn't getting degraded. So I'm gonna keep it as is, click OK. And now let's say we wanna kind of do the opposite of this. Let's say I wanna crop some of these things out. Okay, let me just bring this in a little bit, bring that in. And let's explore what cropping can do for us. I'm just going to kind of maybe create a banner. You're going to be something a little bit creative, just kind of an unusual size, of course. OK, so let's just now see what we can do with our cropping. So our cropping lives right over here. You can see there is our crop icon. I click on that and you're going to see I'm going to have a new set of options here in my tools. You'll also notice that I can now crop manually very easily, just like that. It stays with the same ratio. Okay, notice it says original ratio. And I can also choose my own width and height and resolution. Okay, if I can click on that and I can say, listen, you know what? I know exactly what it's going to be. So let's just say it's gonna be 200 by say 500. Great, 
you can do that. Let me switch it around. Great, I can just simply click on that. And then that's a good way to kind of have a banner for what you're working on. And notice as I do that, it maintains the dimensions of the cropping. Okay, so pretty cool to be able to have that there. Now let's try some of these other presets. I'm just gonna make this a square, all right? And you can see, I can now move my image within the square. Just maybe have everything kind of fit in there nicely, but maybe I wanna just bring it in a little tighter. Just have a nice little collage possibly, and everything is gonna be inside there. I can see what it's gonna look like. And then finally, when I'm done, I can hit on this check mark or hit enter. All right, now you will notice also there is this option to delete cropped pixels. So once I actually crop this, right, everything outside of it's gonna get deleted, okay? So if I uncheck that, then they will not get deleted, so I can always kind of bring them back. All right, so I'm gonna keep that unchecked, click on the check mark, and then bam, there you have it, perfect square. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and undo that, bring that back to where I was just for the sake of this exercise. And I'm gonna encourage you to pause the video to then go ahead and practice this on your own. Now let's continue our layers discussion. On your layers panel, you have a lot of very, very helpful options. You'll notice that there might be some familiar things like a lock icon, you might see that. You might also see a familiar word like opacity. Okay, and also effects and a few of these other things that we're gonna be getting into later on, absolutely. But let's just talk about some of the things that are gonna help us currently in this initial stage. Let's say I keep clicking on this image and like, oops, I don't wanna do that anymore. It keeps getting in the way. I can very easily lock this, so therefore I don't accidentally click on that. It's really good if you have a very busy canvas, if you have a lot of text in there, or anything else like that, you don't want to accidentally click on something. So let me go ahead and click on the lock icon and you'll notice a few things happen. This lock now gets indented. I can see that's highlighted. Notice there's also a lock icon on the Iceberg 2 layer. So when I try to click on that, I can't do it. As long as I try and try and try, I still can't do it. This one, still available. That's great, it's not locked. So how do I unlock it? Just simply click on the Iceberg 2 layer again click on lock, great, and now it's activated again. You'll also notice that the bounding box goes away just the same. So notice I can also click on the lock icon itself right there on the layer if you like. All right, another nice little element is opacity. So what does opacity mean? You might wanna have a nice little sort of see-through option. It's essentially opacity is like transparency. Okay, so right now it is 100% opaque. So if I click on this little dropdown, you will see that I can click here and just drag that down. You can see I'll make that 50% opaque and you can see it becomes sort of ghostly, kind of a nice little effect there. Great, I'm gonna bring that back down. Now, one little cool little pro tip with Photoshop. If you notice, I wanna move my mouse right on top of the word opacity, right? You can see that there. You're gonna see a little hand with a, two little arrows there. If I click and drag on the word opacity, it also allows me to bring it down in real time. We're gonna see that in a few different examples all throughout this class, but you might wanna practice that a few times to really get that down. It's a little bit unusual, but incredibly, incredibly valuable. So I'm gonna bring this to exactly 50 and not have to like see what it's gonna do after the fact, I can do that in real time, okay? Which is pretty nice, I really like that, okay? And I can bring that back up, okay, great and then I click away or I hit enter and I'm good to go, okay? Other times you might want to do some other types of layer organization. You may want to start to group your items as well. So I have all of these items here and I'd like to group them together so they're all images. So I separate them all out from let's say my text that might come in or my background colors. So what I'd like to do is simply click on the first item that's here and then hold down the shift key and click on the last one. And down on the bottom, you will see I have this little folder icon. I click on that, create new group, and that is simply grouped. I double click on group one. I'm just gonna say images, hit enter, and now I've got a group. Fantastic. So we've learned how to rename, we've learned how to group, we learned how to reorder, 
We learned how to lock. We learned how to do opacity. We should feel very comfortable moving forward to manage our layers with our upcoming lessons. Okay, and welcome back. In this next series of lessons, we are going to create this terrifying scene here. You will see that we have a very, very creative use of layers and effects, a little bit of text and a little bit of opacity. Just want to show you here what we're going to be creating and we're going to be able to start this from scratch. So in this lesson, we're going to learn about different types of selection, working with the quick selection tool. We're also going to learn about the magic wand tool. We're going to learn a little bit about the lasso tools. So it's going to be very important we understand layer management at this point, also naming our layers, and then we're going to be able to create these little glows and little strokes and everything. This is going to be a very, very important series of lessons, all kind of sandwiched into a series of many, many lessons. Okay, so how do we create this from scratch? So let's go ahead and watch me as I go ahead and open up to my first file. I'm going to open up to a Scully. This is basically the background of everything. And just notice what the finished product looks like and how it looks now. So how do we work with these? All right, the first thing I wanna do before I do anything else is I'd like to unlock my background. You'll notice that my background is currently locked. Okay, so I wanna be able to play around with that. So I'm gonna unlock that. So very simply, just go ahead and click on that lock as we learned earlier. Now. Let's discuss some of these selection tools, okay? In order to affect it, you have to select it. That's a very, very important adage to take away from really any program, but definitely within Photoshop. So I want to be able to affect this. I wanna be able to make my sky separate from my dinosaurs, separate from my flying saucers, separate from my piazza. If we look at my original document, you will notice that this is currently separated out like whoa how did we do that what is the trick what can we do to make that separated out and there's a number of different ways we can do that and most that you're going to start off with is going to be around selection 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 so if you look over here i have these one two three four icons and remember how i changed my side panel there to be in two columns so mine's going to look like this now, a lot of these panels you're gonna see have little triangles living inside of them. Do you see that it has a little triangle, little triangle, little triangle. That's gonna be very important for us to understand as we move forward with all of our tools to understand that there's something potentially living underneath, living inside them. Okay, you can see, wow, fantastic. A lot of cool stuff. Here's my quick selection tool. Here's my magic wand. I right click on this. You can see, okay, great. There's my different lasso tools. Oh, that's wonderful. What about this guy here, my marquee? I right click, great, wonderful. Now, most of these, if not all of them, have some type of shortcut key associated with them. Like for example, if I move over my move tool, notice there is a V, right? They used to have it as shaped like a V, that's why they had it like a V, like the letter V. Good ones to know about. Here is my magic wand tool, right, for a W. Here is L for a lasso. Okay, so lots of good things to remember, M for marquee. Okay, so definitely some good little takeaways here. So let's talk about the difference between our quick selection tool and our magic wand tool. The quick selection tool is gonna select kind of a whole swath of different series of colors and objects all throughout based off of their different contrasting levels here, as opposed to my magic wand, which is gonna be more about color. It's looking for different colors and it selects like colors. So if I had kind of like a only blue here and not my clouds, then the magic wand tool would be better. But because I have a whole series of like little things here, like my clouds kind of breaking things up, I wanna choose my quick selection tool. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do that. And you'll notice that my mouse now turns into this little circle with a plus sign. Plus meaning it's going to add on to the selection. You'll notice that on my options bar up on top, I also have the plus sign. So if I'm taking away, I can also just click on this to subtract from the selection. But I'm going to add to the selection. Okay, you'll also see that my brush is a certain size right now. It is currently at 40. If I click on this and I can go ahead and make that 
nice and big, I can do that too. Let's bring that back down to 40. But I'd like to show you a nice little pro tip that I prefer, and that's using the right and left bracket keys, the bracket keys in your keyboard, which are right next to the letter P. And that allows me in real time to then make this get bigger or smaller. And that way you have a little more control over it. If it's too big, it's gonna to be too powerful. It's gonna to go too fast, too far. So I'm gonna make it maybe about 50 or so. All right, so that's kind of nice. So the key with our quick selection tool is to go slow and to trust the program that it knows what you want to do. So you can just watch me now and you'll have time to practice as well. So I'm just gonna go in and click very slowly and you'll watch at some point it'll just jump and jump and just make a big jump at some point. Look at that. Wow, because of all that blue right there, okay? It just did a quick selection, didn't it? Now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you'll see that it also didn't get this stuff here, right? Or it over got that because the blue of the dome also got confused with the blue of the sky, all right? So not a big deal. So I'm gonna zoom in. You can zoom in a few different ways, okay? So I'm gonna zoom in by holding down the Alt key in my keyboard and then just scrolling in with my mouse. You can also use the zoom tool, which is right here, or you can just do Control or Command plus plus to zoom in. All right, now, now that I'm zoomed in, I'll be able to say, okay, did a good job, but not a great job. So I'm gonna make my brush a little smaller so it's not super powerful at this point. And I'm just gonna say, I want less of a selection. So look what it keeps doing. Like, oops, I don't want it to just keep adding to the selection. Like, oops, it keeps going in the opposite direction because I'm still adding to the sky. So I have two options here. I can click on this little minus sign or in my opinion, this is even better, hold down the Alt key. See that if I hold down the Alt key or the Option key on the Mac, notice how it becomes a minus. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just give this a little nudge back up and I'm not gonna get this perfect just for the purposes of this exercise. I'm just gonna go and just give this a little bit more, just go up to a little bit more right there. Okay, great. Maybe this right there. And you know, Photoshop does a pretty good job once I do the selection. Just go a little bit more there. Okay, great. And now I wanna zoom out, right? So I can see the whole thing. So I can do exactly the, the counterpart of what I showed you before, which was the alter option and then the zooming or I can do control or command minus minus. But another nice little shortcut is just if you do control zero, zero. Think about that as like ground zero. It takes you back to a best fit of things. That's great. All right, now I want this sky to be on its own layer. So therefore I can create a situation like that. How do I do that? Remember we talked earlier about how right click goes a long way in this program? If I right click on that sky, I get a lot of options here. Deselect, a very important one, absolutely. I can select inverse, like, oh, that's interesting. I can select the opposite, so it would select the piazza instead of the sky. Cool, a lot of cool things here. But what we're gonna focus on here is this really neat feature called layer via cut. So in other words, it's saying we're gonna create a new layer and also cut it at the same time. Really fantastic. So I do that and you barely notice anything here. It looks almost exactly the same, if not the same. But now I have a new layer that was now separated out. So I'm gonna go ahead and double click on that and call that sky. Wonderful, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video for a second and I'm going to have you Go ahead and do what we just did. Now that we have our sky all set up, let's see what we need to do to bring in our other creatures and how we need to make it look how this is looking in terms of our layer management and different types of selection. So again, we're gonna bring in or place some of our objects. So I'm gonna bring in my little dinosaur here or a very large dinosaur. And we'll see we have a bit of a problem right away. Number one, this particular document has a white background. Okay, it also has a little bit of other things happening here, the size, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go ahead and resize that. Holding down the shift key, I resize that. You'll also notice that the problem is the fact that it's in front, it's on the piazza, not in the sky. I want it towering over just like that. 
So how can I deal with these issues? Earlier, we talked about one type of selection method, and that was the quick selection tool. We also discussed the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool is very good for selecting colors, colors that are all sort of in the sp same spectrum of colors. So my quick selection tool would certainly work for this, but my magic wand tool is going to be ideal for something like this. So let's discuss that. I click on this and we're going to see that my mouse now changes this little magic wand. And you'll also notice that my options panel now has a series of different options. And namely, there's something called the tolerance level, the tolerance level. So essentially it's saying, hey, how tolerant do you want me to be for this color? So if I have like light blue and you want me to also choose dark blue, I'm gonna bring up a high tolerance. In this case, since it's mostly all white, I can probably go down to like 20 or 30 or 40, something like that, or even lower to like the teens or something like that. Also notice how I'm clicking and dragging, just like I showed you earlier with my opacity, to go up and down just like that on my tolerance level. So I'll just bring that down and I can always experiment with it. And then watch what happens now when I click on the white, everything gets selected there, okay? Everything but the gray, in fact, okay? It doesn't choose anything within the green, that's pretty great. So let me try that again now, going a little higher. And I'll choose my color again. Oh, it gets even more of that gray. I can go even higher than that. Okay, pretty good. See that this time it went all the way up to 53 and it got everything, everything, and I'll just more manually go in and take, all, take care of that. Now, watch what happens now when I try to get rid of this white background. I'm gonna hit delete, right, very simply, and I get an error message. And this is gonna be one of those things that's gonna make you go crazy, crazy, crazy. Could not complete your request because the smart object is not directly editable. What does that mean? What is a smart object and why is it not letting me do what I want to do? I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I want you to notice here that I have this little guy right there. And notice that my other icons do not have that. Okay, This is indicating to me that this is a smart object. When you place in a document from the outside, you are going to place it in as a smart object. That is designed to protect it. Okay, in case you want to keep, you want to preserve the integrity of that image so you don't actually mess with the original, that's why we have a smart object. Later on in other exercises, we're going to talk about filters. Filters are going to be very important to work with smart objects. In this case, we don't want it to be a smart object. We don't care about that. So I want to do rasterizing. So if I right click in this little gray area on my layer, then right there is rasterize layer. I click on that, notice the little icon goes away, it's still selected, and I can hit delete, and look at that, beautiful, and it's floating right there, okay? Amazing, 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 and you'll have to do that a lot of times. If you copy and paste the document, copy and paste the image, you won't have to do that. When you place it, you will have to do it, okay? Now notice my little marching ants there, I don't want those anymore, so in other words, I'm gonna deselect. So I'm just gonna right click, and you're gonna see here is deselect. Also notice a really good keyboard shortcut is Control D. So if I do Control D, that also makes it deselect. So I like that one a lot better, but notice you can also right click. All right, <clears throat> now if I go back to my move tool, I'm able to then move this guy separately however much I want to. Now I don't really necessarily need to worry about his little feet there but I could very easily get rid of those if I wanted to at some point, right? So I could use my quick selection tool if I wanted to, and I could just get right there in between his cute little toes, hit delete, get in there. Okay, maybe got a little bit too much, so I hold down the Alt key and then just get rid of that. Okay, so you wanna practice some of these things there. Another really good one to know about is just the very simple eraser tool, okay, which is living over here on my tools panel, I right click on there, there's my eraser tool. Oh, and look at that. The keyboard shortcut is simply just E. So if I just wanna erase something, I can very easily erase it just the same, okay? All right, just a little bit of stuff around the edge. Watch out for his claws, okay? Very good. 
okay? And I'm not gonna worry about this too much. I'm gonna do control zero to come back out. All right, now, how do I create this effect where he is behind the building? Okay, what do I do here? Let's look at our layers and let's just see what's actually going on for all of these guys here. Notice how I have my sky background. Oh, way at the bottom, my dinosaurs are right above those. In this case, my sky is above my layer zero, which I'm gonna rename as Piazza. And I'm just gonna bring my sky down below. And then notice I still don't have any effect here. So what I need to do is bring my dinosaur in between the sky and the piazza, because that's essentially what's happening in reality. But really what we're doing it from bottom to top is the same as front to back. So if I drag this in between, my dinosaur is literally in between them, now I get that awesome, very cool, very realistic effect, and now they're terrorizing the poor people of Rome, and wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and do that one more time. I'm gonna do it a little bit faster this time with the other dinosaur. Place embedded. Okay. Go ahead and resize that. Hit enter. I'm gonna use my magic wand tool. That's great, does a pretty good job. But this time I'm going to rasterize it before I hit delete. So I'm just gonna right click on Dino One, rasterize layer. Now when I hit delete, wonderful, control D. And now I'm just gonna move her down below just like that. And now they are partners in crime, wonderful. That's great. All right, now you have some other files that you can work with on your own, which is just bringing in the couple of flying saucers and essentially we'll have you do the same thing to catch up. Now, welcome back. Let's take a look at some of the other selection options that Photoshop has and let's see which one is best for us. So I will bring in my pterodactyls now and uh, there is one right there. Now, my magic wand tool, as I established, is the best one here for us. Now, but I want you to see other ones that could be beneficial for you. So let me go ahead and resize this, and let me go ahead and say rasterize layer. But I want you to see how the lasso tool can really be beneficial for you, working with the regular lasso tool, the polygonal lasso tool, and the magnetic lasso tool. The lasso tool is good just for a very manual way of just cutting some things out. That could really be helpful for you if that's really all you want. So notice I just drew around there. And now if I hit delete, oops, it does the opposite. I don't want that. So earlier we talked about how we can do an inverse selection. I do that, then I hit delete. Okay, great. So now I have this kind of interesting effect, okay? Not exactly what I want, so let me go ahead and undo and deselect. You'll notice also there is a polygonal lasso tool. So that's essentially gonna give me like straight lines. What am I trying to do? In this case, you can see it's gonna allow me to do these just kind of hard angles to be able to do my selection. I'll go all the way back to where I started. Great, wonderful. Now I can go ahead and do the same thing, delete or do an inverse if I like to as well. You'll also notice that I made a little bit of a mistake here. If you ever want to add to a selection, you can easily do that. So if I go back to my lasso tool and I wanna to add to the selection, if I hold down the shift key on my keyboard to add to the selection, I'm able to do this more kind of manual way of now adding on to things. If I want to remove from that selection, I selected way too much, right? I can also remove it. So again, this is shift to add to the selection and alt to take away from the selection, okay? There is alt, okay? And then there is also going to be shift if I want to add to the selection, okay? See that? And that is going to be a good combo of when you start working with a number of different selection tools, okay? Because notice how I started off with one selection tool and then I switched over to another selection tool. If I wanted to add on something using my quick selection tool and combine it with my lasso tool, I absolutely can do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and deselect this 
And now let's finally talk about the magnetic lasso tool. Now, for certain things, the magne magnetic lasso tool is going to be really like your best friend because what it does is it magnetizes to the edge of the particular object. It recognizes contrast between colors and its background and context. So if I choose magnetic lasso tool, I want you to notice when I move my mouse to the edge here, it kind of drops a little egg. I'm not even clicking. I'm just moving my mouse. Now I clicked. And now you can see, all right, it did an OK job. But you can see I'm just kind of very, very slowly moving my mouse. I'm just going to click, click. I'm just going to go a little faster this time. Just go, go, go. Just watch how smart Photoshop is to be able to get the edge of what I am trying to select. And you can see, all right, great. And then when I come to the beginning, notice I get this little circle. It tells me that I'm at the beginning. And now I've got it. And it did a pretty good job. Of course, I don't need this because I would use my magic wand tool, but you'll notice how amazing the magnetic lasso tool can be for you. Now, if I zoom in, I'll notice that it didn't do a great job. So then what did we just learn? We learned how I could go to my lasso tool and then hold down my shift key and then just add to my selection. See that? I'm just going to add to this selection. So think about your lasso as, or all of these really, as like one big toolbox as you do this, okay? So you really wanna think about like, well, I can use this type of selection tool for one thing and then another one. So like the lasso tool is a little more surgical where this is a little more macro working with our quick selection tools. And these are more kind of specialists if you think about it, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out, control zero. And I'm going to just now do control D. I don't really need to do that. And here we go. Let's use our magic wand tool. Click. Wow, that is so much easier. Now you probably even have more of an appreciation for all how that works. I'm going to hit the V key to go back to my move tool and then click and drag, make that a little smaller, have that kind of flying overhead. All right. And then I'm going to give you a few minutes to practice. And then I'm on my own off record. I'm going to bring in my flying saucer and my pterodactyl just the same. And I'll have you do the same thing on your own. So we'll see you after you practice. Welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that exercise. And now we're back to our Paleolithic Piazza. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to work with the images that we currently have, our pterodactyl and our flying saucer. And we're gonna add on a little bit more dynamicism. We're gonna make things a little more terrifying for those earthlings down below. Or we're gonna add on more pterodactyls and we're gonna add on more uh, flying saucers. But we're gonna do it in this really kind of a neat way called cloning, cloning. So cloning is all about using the Alt or Option key while also selecting with our Move tool. So let's say I wanna give this lady here a husband. So what I'm gonna do is simply hold down the Alt key and you'll notice how my mouse now has two little arrows there. Watch what happens now when I click and drag. Bam, I just cloned. Amazing, it's a very quick cut and paste. So the same thing for the flying saucer. See that, hold down the Alt or Option key, click and drag and now I can move that wherever I want. Wonderful, okay, and I can also rotate these do that, okay, that's great. Hit enter, remember because you're transforming and I can rotate this one that way as well, okay? All right, but now let's say I wanted to have it so it was going in a completely opposite direction. How would I do that? If you go over here to the edit menu and you go over here to transform, you'll notice how there's an option to flip if you wanted to. So now you can see I flipped him horizontally or her Okay, going out horizontally. Okay, cool. And now that's going over here, right? There's going to be a battle between the pterodactyl and the T-Rex. Oh my goodness, things are about to get terrifying. Okay, see, so, okay. Very easily, I was able to resize it and it looks very different than the other ones. So maybe you're making this look like it's a little further away. So you make it smaller. Okay, and I'm going to rotate it. So you have lots and lots of options to do here to kind of create this reality. And see, this one is in the foreground. So it really looks like it is coming in very much closer. All right, so I'm gonna give you maybe a minute to practice that. 
I'll go ahead and stop the video and practice that on your own. Okay, welcome back. Now, let's see some other things we might want to do. If we go back to our original, you'll see that some of our flying saucers have a nice little glow. What we're going to discuss next is the effects on our layers. So you will see here in our layers panel, I have something called effects. See that? There are a lot of effects that we can do. So let's just go ahead and check out some of these. Okay, if I click on effects, you will see I can put a stroke, I can put a shadow on here, I can put an outer glow, so many, so many things that we can do. All right, so you wanna use these things sparingly. You wanna kinda of use them for effect to be able to communicate what you're trying to communicate, draw some attention, but of course, you don't wanna abuse them. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. So let's just do a nice little effect for this flying saucer. What kind of effects can we do for this one. Let's just give it a nice little glow. So notice what layer I'm on, very important. And I'm just gonna click on effects. And I'm just gonna give this flying saucer an outer glow. And you'll notice that it gives a glow right away. Why is it doing that? Because I have my preview chosen here. So make sure preview is always a good choice to have there. Just make sure that that is available for you. Okay. and. Mine potentially, or for you, it might or may not be um, defaulting to brown. Not the best kind of glow color, right? So these are my colors right here. So I'm gonna click on that and I'm just gonna choose, let's just find yellow right here. So notice on the right-hand side, I have my kind of whole spectrum of colors. And then here, I'm gonna be able to find that level of, of, um, of hue um, of that color as well. Okay, so I'm gonna click okay, that's fine. Then I want to adjust a number of different things for this particular uh, object that I have for this particular effect. So what I'm going to do is bring down my opacity so it looks a little more glowy. Remember opacity is like the transparency. I can also adjust the spread. I can also adjust the size of that like, ooh, okay, maybe a little more subtle. And then what about the range? What does that do? Okay, eh, I probably want that to be not so hard edged. Jittery, do you want it to be a little more jittery, right? It's gonna be kind of like look a little, kind of dissolved a little bit with like lots of little dots. Okay, so maybe this is exactly what I want. Just notice there's a lot of other options here, potentially a little more advanced for us at this stage, but this is very much the kind of a spice to taste thing. A lot of these things, especially when you have preview chosen here. Okay, now this is great. I love this. I'm gonna click okay and that looks wonderful. I like it. it. Looks very, very terrifying. Very convincing. There is light coming off of this. But what about the other one, the mothership? The mothership should also have the same thing. So I want you to notice on my layers panel, I now have two new elements that have appeared here on my panel. One that says effect, and one is the type of effect. So let's say I want to use this effect on this flying saucer down below. So flying saucer one copy has the effect on it, but I want to apply it to here very easily. All I need to do is hold down the alt key again. Remember how we did alt to clone? Now we're going to do alt to clone the effect. So watch this. I click and drag down below right on top of this. And now, wow, like magic, there it is. And I'll just go ahead and do this, this and that. But it's great, okay? It's as easy as that, cloning, cloning, cloning. Now, another question you might be having is, well, let's say I wanna change the color. I love the outer glow, but I don't want it to be that color for this particular one. How do I deal with that? Anytime you want to manipulate any of these effects, we can do that by simply double clicking on the name of the effect. So if I double click, you will see it takes me right back to my layer styles. And now I can go ahead and make a change to that. So let's just drag that over so I can see it. And I'm gonna make this maybe a red color. Ah, look at that, very nice. I can adjust the opacity and all the other stuff if I want to. Okay, and those of you who are a little bit more advanced, if you like to, you can always save this as a new style, meaning then that way you'll be able to save it over and over and over again, and it's gonna be saved 
inside of this styles group. Okay, a little more advanced for right now. We'll be getting into that in my advanced class, which you can uh, click on another video to see that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and please go ahead and practice. I'd love to hear how you're doing in the comments. Okay, now to finish up this particular document and this particular project, we're gonna bring in this nice little shape and some text for us to work with. So this is gonna be our first introduction to shapes and also to working with type. And we're also gonna work with a little bit of opacity and we're going to work with um, other different kind of effects that we can put around text. You can see a nice cool little effect there. So what are we gonna do? We are going to just draw out a very basic shape. So how do we work with shapes? Shapes are very powerful in Photoshop and any kind of graphic design because it's really designed to frame things, right? It's really designed for you to kind of really call attention to something, make it stand out. And this provides a nice little background for our items. So where are we gonna find our shapes? You can see over here in the left-hand side, there should be a little rectangle icon for us to work with. If you right click on that, you're gonna see that, oh, there's a rectangle. There's all kinds of other shapes that we can do. For our purposes right now, we're just gonna choose rectangle. And you will see that there are different colors that we can then apply when we draw out our shapes. <clears throat> so our colors can be activated in a number of different ways. You will see here that there is this little color is the foreground color, and this is gonna be the background color. Primarily, we're gonna be working with the foreground color. That's gonna be the important part of it. You'll also notice that over here in the upper left is our fill color, just the same. So you can access it in one of two ways. So you'll also note that when I draw something out, am I gonna be drawing out a shape, a path, or pixels? These two are gonna be a little bit more advanced, so let's make sure that we are drawing out, in fact, a shape. And what color shape am I gonna do? Well, that's up to me. So how do I access all of my colors? I'm just gonna simply click once on this little square and you will see that it's gonna take me to this amazing color picker where I can then choose any color I want from here. We've seen a few exercises already on this. I can go to my blacks down here, my whites up here, and then really anything in between by clicking here, 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 and then anything within that spectrum. Now, some of you might know exactly what color you want to apply. So you'll see how there's our RGB over here on the right-hand side. There's also your CMYK. So your design team might say, hey, listen, we need to use our company colors, so please put in our RGB value of 65723. Cool, damn, bam, type that in, wonderful. Or our CMYK, bam, type that in, whatever you want to do. Okay, you'll also note that there is the HSB your hue, your saturation, and your brightness. So notice how I just click and drag going across right now. The saturation of that color then changes. Saturation just basically means the level of color in a thing, right? So how saturated is that gonna be? Is it gonna be a very, very colorful red or a less colorful red? So no saturation basically means black and white or grayscale. Okay, our hue, notice how the hue now changes. Essentially, we're just going from blue to red to green, and then brightness as what you'd expect, right? It's gonna make it, whatever that color is, just a brighter version of that color, if you wanted to control all that, okay? So up to you. Now, you'll also see that I have a little eyedropper that appears. When I move my mouse off of the color picker, I can actually choose from my canvas a color that I want. Notice I'm choosing the blue, it changes to blue. I'm gonna to go to this little green, it's gonna to change to whatever his little scaly brown color is. Okay, great, I can go to my flying saucer, a little more gray, fantastic, wonderful. Okay, so I have all the options in the world for colors. So I'm just gonna choose black. Great, I click okay. And now, very simply, I'm gonna click and drag. And notice I'm clicking and drag starting off of the canvas, just to make sure, in case I wanna have you know, zero bleed like that. So it just goes right off the edge. That's great. And I can go back to my move tool to then resize it accordingly. And then I click the checkbox. I can move it wherever I want. And that's amazing. It's all set, ready to go. Now, if we go back to our original document, you'll be able to see that I have a little bit of transparency here. 
So how do I do that? If I click back on the shape, I want you to see here that I have this new layer called rectangle. And we have this section here called opacity that I can now affect the opacity of that. We did an exercise on that with our RAM earlier on. We were able to actually have our RAM or iceberg a little more see-through. So we'll do the same thing now with our shape and we'll see, oh, that's kind of cool. So I can make this a little more see-through so I can see through that shape. So it gives a little bit of dimensionality, a little more kind of visual interest, if you will. All right now. Your next question might be, well, what if I want to change the color of this rectangle, All right? What if I want to make this transparency, but I want to actually make it a different color of transparency. If you double click on the shape itself, right? Notice what I did here. So you mean not on the shape, but on the actual thumbnail, right? You want to actually double click on this right there. It's going to take you back to your color picker. Amazing, look at that. And I can now change that to red and do whatever I wanna do. Okay, so double clicking on the thumbnail on the layer panel brings you right back to your color picker. Okay, nice little pro tip there. You'll also see that there is a properties panel that also gives you some other options as well if you wanna experiment with that. Okay, so your properties panel, you should have that open from when we first started. So if you click on the fill, click on that, and then you click on that guy, that takes you to the same exact thing. All right, so totally up to you. Some of you might be more comfortable with the properties panel at this point, or you're more comfortable with the layers panel. So now I have that color. I'll let maybe bring that down to a kind of a darker color. Let's just bring this down and wonderful. Now I'm done. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video have you practice working with our shapes, our transparency, working with color, and then changing the color. When we come back, we'll do a quick little introduction to how we can work with type. So in this next lesson, we're gonna learn just a little introduction to how we can work with type. Different sizes, different spacing, and maybe put some effects on it. So taking a look at our intergalactic Italy, let's follow suit. So. We've been talking a lot about keyboard shortcuts here and there. So the easiest keyboard shortcut to remember is simply the T to get to our type tool. So you'll notice here is the T, but if I literally just type out T, it just takes me right there. So that's one you definitely want to commit to memory if possible. As soon as I click on that T, I want you to notice a few things. Up on top, I'm going to get a whole bunch of options here in my options panel all around type. So it's very important before we start typing anything out, we identify what size the font it's going to be typing out in, okay? Because sometimes if it's too big, we just can't see any type at all. So that's just one little tip for you because like, I know I'm typing something out, but if it's coming in as 100 points because that's the last thing you did, then you're gonna have some problems, you're gonna be confused. All right, so just keep that in mind. So kind of good rule of thumb. I like to just make mine a little bit smaller just because I can always make it bigger, okay? So, but you can of course make it smaller, but sometimes you can't find it to begin with. So I also might want to figure out which font I'm gonna use ahead of time. So let's just do a quick little introduction of where we can actually find our fonts and how we can also filter some of our fonts. So here's all our fonts, very similar to any other program you've probably used before. But there's a few other additions that you may not have seen before, which I really, really like. All right, you're gonna see here how they give you, of course, a little preview of what it looks like. But then you'll see how there's these little stars here. So for example, like my luckiest guy, I can click on that little star and let you notice how the star gets darker. Let me just try another one. Let's just use this Bauhaus burner. Okay, I'm just kind of shopping around. What am I doing? I am saving these as my favorites for later. Comic Sans, no thank you. All right, keep going on from there. Okay, great, okay, wonderful. So when does this come into play? I just saved all my favorites. If I click on that little star right now, it filters it out, so then bam, all I show is like my company fonts, my client fonts. Okay, great, I know we're only using those because my computer has so many fonts to work with, Right? I don't want to see all of them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click that again, and then it comes right back. 
You'll also notice that there's a little drop down menu where it says all classes. Click on that and you might see some different things that you recognize like a serif fonts. Only show me my serif fonts, right? Serifs just have these little tails and hats. Sans serif does not. Okay, what about a slab serif? See with that, it's gonna be a little more kind of boldish, if you will, right? Bigger serifs, right? Bigger tails and big feet. Okay, and then you can see handwritten, decorative, all these things here. I'm gonna come back to all classes. Just a good takeaway here is that Photoshop gives you a lot of control over your fonts, what you wanna see, how you wanna see it. Okay, excellent. So I'm gonna choose my luckiest guy and I'm gonna now draw out a text box so it fits in perfectly within that text box. That's one option. Or you could just simply click and type and it'll just go on and on and on and on. I like to actually create the text box. So I'm creating a sort of beginning and end so it kind of gets confined. Not too much, not too little. Now, what Photoshop will do is it will put in this filler text for you, but I'm just gonna go to override that. So I'm gonna just start typing intergalactic, what did I say? Can't even remember what I said. I'll just say Piazza, right? Let's do it a little different this time. Okay, intergalactic Piazza. Okay, and then I have to tell that I'm done. So go back to your check mark. It's great. And if you see here, I have a new layers panel, excuse me, a new layer called intergalactic Piazza. Wonderful. Now, this of course is not the color I want, it's not the size I want. So I need to go ahead and edit that. So, how do I edit this text? If you simply just double click inside there, and then if you triple click, you get all of the text. Double clicking goes right inside of it. Triple clicking selects all the text inside there. Now I can make my type a little bit bigger. I can change the color. I can do all kinds of different things to it. So what's a great way to make it bigger is if you move your mouse over the little T and the big T, just by simply clicking and dragging, I'll be able to, okay, great, that's wonderful. I can then do it that way rather than having to click on the drop down. It's again, we've seen this what three or four times already, how we can work with this. Great. Let's make it a little bit bigger. All right, so it just stays within that box. Click on my checkbox, go to my move tool. And then in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use my arrow keys. Why am I using my arrow keys in my keyboard? That's a really great pro tip for moving your content using your arrow keys because that way I'm not accidentally clicking on this other shape here. This is the first situation where we've actually had a little bit of a potential issue where I might accidentally click on this and then that gets moved. If I use my arrow keys on my keyboard, I can then just isolate that without having to accidentally click on something else. And if you hold down the shift key, it goes 10 pixels instead of one pixel. Okay, so you'll get a chance to practice that when we take our little break. All right, now again, I'm gonna go ahead and select all my type and I'm just gonna make that maybe simple white for right now. Click okay. Great, that's going to be just bringing in some very simple type. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video Give you a chance to practice that and then you know feel free to filter some of your type change the size use some of those little shortcuts that we did now we left off typing in our intergalactic piazza and if you remember our initial one we had a nice little effect we had what we call a stroke in fact two strokes on this particular set of type so how can we do that for this particular one? We've already done a type of effect on our flying saucer. See that, how we had a little glow effect around there? We had this little glow here. And we can tell that they're having effects on there because it literally says effects on here. See that? And we wanna do something similar for our type. So how can we do that? So our type level layer is selected. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down here to effects, and we're gonna do a stroke. So I click on that and you can see, wow, just like that, it has this really cool outline around it. That's what a stroke is in Photoshop language. Now, very similar to when we worked with our outer glow, we have additional options for that stroke. 
you will see here I have the size and I have the color. So if I want to change the size of that stroke, I can easily do that for differing effects, right? See kind of a fun sort of bubbly effect, or maybe just you want to have a very simple, minimal little outline around it, okay? Now the other question is, where do you want it to be, right? What's the position of the stroke? Well, of course I want it on the outside, but guess what? You can kind of make it a little more thin where you kind of have it on the inside of the letters or you have it somewhere in the middle. I'm gonna put mine on the outside outside. I kind of like that because I still want to see some of the letters in there. Here, opacity, you can bring down that stroke so it's a little more see-through. I'm gonna keep mine nice and solid and I'm gonna keep mine at this color, red. Beautiful, I love that. All right, now if I click OK, I'll be able to see that I now have this effect, and this time it's a stroke as opposed to the other one, which was an outer glow. So let's say I want to affect this yet more, because earlier we saw how this one actually has two strokes. Huh, well that's interesting. How do we do that? This is a relatively new feature inside of Photoshop. So if I double click back on the stroke, I want you to see how it takes me now over to all my different layer styles, including the stroke. What I'd like to do is add on an additional stroke, and that is available through this little plus sign. Really, really neat feature. So when I click on this little plus sign, say, oh, okay, you know what? You wanna do one stroke and you wanna do another stroke? Sure, great. So let me go ahead and just choose green, do a nice little dark green. Okay, I can see that there, maybe not so dark. Okay, it's done that, but then what happened to my red? What's going on here? So let's just see what happens if I make this a little bit bigger. Okay, it's good. But what about this one? Let's make this one bigger. Oh, I see. Okay, interesting. So they are playing with each other, but one just has to be bigger than the other, but it does allow me to have two strokes. Okay, so you can have a really a lot, a lot of fun with these. You'll also notice how you can do the same thing with a lot of these other layer styles by just adding on additional ones. So I encourage you to play around with additional ones, just adding on maybe some drop shadows, adding on some inner glow, some inner shadows, and then even going a step further and then adding on additional ones just the same. And then some of you, like I said in the earlier lesson, might be feeling a little ambitious to then try to even do a new style and then saving it so you can use it over and over and over again. So I will click OK and I will bask in the glory of this. And if you love this, go ahead and save this, save it as a PSD, save it as a JPEG if you want to, save it as a PNG, save it as a TIFF, save it as a PDF if you like. We're done with this project and we'll move on to some other great stuff in just a moment. But please practice this up, make sure you got it, and look forward to seeing you in the next video. Let's go ahead and switch up gears a little bit. This exercise is gonna be about working with shapes. Earlier, we worked with just drawing out a very basic shape, which was just a rectangle. Now we're gonna learn about different kinds of shapes, how to manipulate shapes, and even working with some of these custom shapes like animals and different all kinds of icons and things like that. And of course, working with all kinds of different layers here. So let's just start off creating a new document. Then I'm gonna go over to my saved and I'm gonna to go to my landscape, but this time I'm gonna change that. So you can see how saving our presets can really be very helpful for us. I click on that and bam, I'm ready to go to then draw out my shapes. Now we've already seen that we can draw out shapes very quickly and easily. We've also seen how we can have a background also quickly and easily. So I would like to use my layer adjustment to then just have a nice color background. So I'm gonna go over here to my solid color underneath my adjustment layer, my little black and white cookie there. I'm just gonna have that as my background, okay? And I'll just do like this nice, soft, little blue color, that's great. And now, that is not necessarily a shape, it's just a color fill. And if I wanted to change this, I can very double, very easily double click on this, okay? And I can go and make that a little bit darker, right? Or change my brightness on there, okay? That's great. But now, let's see what we can do to create different types of elements. Like this frame, for example. How do I create a frame like that? 
many times you will be creating like newsletters, you'll be creating posters, and you'll want to have things like that, right? That's gonna really encapsulate your content. So that is gonna be a combination of a fill and stroke setting, right? So far we've already talked about strokes, how it's like an outline of something. And we've also talked a little bit about how we had our fill for our rectangle in the last exercise. In this case, we wanna draw out something that has no fill, but has a certain stroke and a certain stroke value. So let's go ahead and just choose my rectangle. And I'm gonna choose my color of my rectangle. I'm just gonna make that maybe gray. Of course I can change, so let's not worry about that too much. And you will notice up on top, in addition to my fill, I now have something that says stroke right there. It's like, oops, what did I do? I just changed the fill color. That actually doesn't make any sense. I was so used to that. It's like, oh, wait a second. I actually don't want a fill color. Hmm, what do I do? How do I deal with that? Because I actually do want a stroke color and I also want to adjust the stroke value, right? Which is going to be, that's gonna be my width of my outline. So let's say I don't want a, stroke, a fill color. I'm gonna click on my fill box right there and I'm gonna choose this little slash to say no fill color. I'm gonna come over to here, come to my little color picker, and then choose whatever color I want for that outline. Okay, so again, I'll come back to my grayish blue. I click okay. And I'm not quite ready to draw it out yet because I'd like to have a certain thickness. And again, I can change this. I'm just gonna make that, let's say exactly 15. Now I'm ready to draw. So click and drag, click away, go back to my move tool, not too bad. I click back on it, and now how do I change the thickness? Uh-oh, Photoshop doesn't really give me that option at this point, but what it does do is give me the option in my properties panel. We're gonna go a little bit deeper into the properties panel and where it says appearance and all these other options here. This is gonna be invaluable for you for so many, so many different things. This is a relatively new thing in Photoshop, working with the properties panel. So let's go ahead and check out what our options are. It's just gonna drag this over here, bring this down, and let's just see what we can do now. I can now make this a lot thicker if I want to, that's pretty neat. And of course, make sure making sure this is selected just make this exactly 20 if I'd like to. Let's change that to 20. Great, slight little adjustment there. And you'll also see I have a few other things I can do. So I can make it dashed if I wanted to. But I'm gonna bring that back to solid. And there we have it. Cool, love that. It's exactly what I want it to be. You'll also notice a few other options here. Namely, my corner radius, corner radius. What is a corner radius? Well, I'm gonna move my mouse over this and remember, look for that little finger with the little, with the double little arrows there. Click and drag that all the way to let's say 30. And now, ooh, that's kind of neat. I get this little rounded corner set of options there. Okay, you'll also see that there's a little link icon here because sometimes you only want one part to be linked, one part to be linked up to the others and not the other parts to be linked. So in other words, you want them to be isolated. Right now, if I uncheck that and I make just the bottom ones go to zero, zero is the other way, okay, you can see, cool. Only the top part has the little rounded corner radius and then this one has zero pixel, zero pixel corner radius. So you have a lot of options to work with. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and bring that all back. So they are, let's just say 25, 25, all right. And these guys are all going back on their own. Okay, 25, let's unlock these. Just adding on 25 for all of them. Okay, great. And you can see, bam, there we are. And let's keep those in sync with each other, great. So what we've done here is we've seen that we can create a shape that has no fill and we're also able to change the color of the stroke and the thickness of the stroke 
as well as working with corner radius, right? Just like that. Wonderful. Now let's go a little bit deeper with our shapes. Well, we'll start working with custom shapes and also different other shapes. So if you look back at my original one, I just have these basic shape of circles. So let me go ahead and just draw out a circle. And I'm gonna draw out a perfect circle in this case, right? How do I draw out a perfect circle? Very simply, we're gonna hold down the shift key as I do it. So before you start drawing, it's always a good idea to just take a look at what you're actually going to be drawing out. I don't want a stroke, I want to fill. So I have to go back here and say, no stroke. Make sure, making sure nothing is selected. Okay, you just saw me, I still had something selected because it's gonna override what you have selected. So no stroke. And then I'm just gonna choose this nice little color there. And I'm gonna hold down the shift key as I click and drag. And then you will see, I got a perfect circle. That's exactly that color. Go back to my move tool, click and drag wherever you want it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clone this. I love the size of this. I love the shape of it, everything. I'm gonna clone it. If you recall, cloning is what? Alt and clicking, right? So if I hold down the Alt key, and I click and drag, Alt, click and drag. Okay, wonderful. Now I can very easily change the color of these using my appearance panel. So I'm just gonna choose any color that's available here. Let's not worry too much on that. Click on that, as that pops up, and I'll choose this one. Okay, great. Now my issue compared to these is that notice how these little circles are beneath my little front front border here. So how do I deal with that? To save me some time, I'm just gonna move my rectangle all the way up to the top. Remember about layer management. So just drag that to the top because that's exactly what I want. I want this little border to be above everything else. Okay, it's as easy as that. All right, so just move this around however you want it, get a little more kind of visual interest, get a little more interesting. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and let you practice that and we'll come back in just a moment. Have fun. Now, going to the next level of shapes, we can see that if we right click on our shapes icon, we'll see that we can simply draw out a rounded rectangle from start if we want to. We just drew out the ellipse, which was also the circle. Then we also have some other ones like a triangle and a polygon. Let's just check out what the polygon looks like. Polygon essentially means like anything that's not going to be a circle or a rectangle or a triangle, right? So it could be like an octagon, something like that. So if we click on that, you'll notice that in our options panel, way up on top here, it gives us the option to choose how many sides this thing is going to be. So I'll just keep it at five for right now. And now if I just draw it out, I will see I now have a pentagon, okay? Pretty simple. Let me go ahead and just undo that. And let's just try another one and maybe in a little bit of a different way. I click on this and instead of choosing this option up there, I'm just gonna simply click in an empty area. And you'll see how it gives me the option to choose how many sides I want. So this time I'm gonna choose eight sides. And you'll also see that I could choose my corner radius. If I want to do a star, I can absolutely do an eight pointed star right now if I wanted to, I'll do that in just a second. And when you're drawing it, maybe you want to draw it out from the center. You can see how easy that is. And I can change this to the color of a stop sign and it's done and done. Okay, very neat. Okay, and now let's talk about the star option. So I'm gonna click on this and I'm gonna click once again in a neutral area, and this time I'm gonna make it into a 10-pointed star, and I'm just gonna make this, I'll just say 50%. And you will see, I have this really neat way of making a star very quickly and easily. Okay, so practice some of those things here. Now also, don't forget that you have your properties panel to work with a lot of these things here. And then you'll see how 
I can then change the size if I want to. I can change the inset of my star. Properties panel is invaluable. So check all those things out. We'll just see how I can make this. Have more sides, just like that. Less sides, just like that. And then maybe I want to make this 80%. You'll see how it kind of blasts out like that. And now I have a nice little label for something. Great. So a lot of different ways to be creative with the different things that you are creating. So let me get rid of these. And we'll talk about the last segment of our stars component, excuse me, of our uh, shapes component. And that's gonna be hiding over here in our custom shape tool, our custom shape tool. You'll see that Photoshop gives you a number of different shapes to work with that are not these standard shapes, okay? These are like vector shapes. They kind of look like icons. They can be like graphics and animals and nature oriented things. So I'm gonna click on this and you will see that over here on the top toolbar, you will see I have something called shapes. And I click on that little drop down, and you'll see that there's gonna be a number of different categories. Yours may look a little different than mine, just depending on what you have set up, what you've worked on last. So if you click on this little gear icon, you can see you can import some shapes, you can add some shapes on there if you like to. And if I click on just any one of these, you'll see that they give you these really nice, sophisticated shapes for you to work with. These are essentially our drawings, and they're known as vector drawings. So if you've ever taken an Illustrator class, they're fantastic, okay? They're basically like smooth lines that you can expand out infinitely, and they look very, very professional and very clean. So you can take a look at some of these. So I'm just gonna bring in this beautiful Leaping Gazelle and click and drag just like that. And then the color is gonna come in the exact same color that I chose. I don't want that. I'm gonna choose black. And just like that, I now have a cool little logo that I brought in there or a cool little design, cool little visual element. Okay, let's go ahead and just try another one. So I'm gonna choose from my shapes drop down. I will choose this little moose and just draw it out. That comes in, not the color I want, so go over to my fill color, choose that color, go to my move tool, and then, uh-oh, guess what? It decided to not put it in the right layer. So I need to move that up above my ellipse, and now, and so again, all that layer management comes into play when Photoshop gives us something unexpected. All right, I'll go ahead and do one more. Let's choose another animal. How about a kangaroo? And I'm holding down the shift key to make it so it stays in proportion. Okay, very good. So it's coming in a little bit off the circle. So I can just very simply go back to my move tool, select it, and then I can resize it. I don't even I could even rotate it in such a way. So if I go back to my edit tool, I go over here to transform path, and guess what? There is flip horizontal, and now it's fitting where I want it to be. Maybe get his tail back in there, or maybe move my green circle in there. Lots of options to work with. And then finally, I'm gonna make that kangaroo. All set, squared away, and that's great. So you can see how we have a number of different options for us to work with, from basic shapes to more advanced shapes, to custom shapes, polygon shapes, and ways to make them perfect shapes by holding down the shift key, adding on stars, and also changing the colors. All right, so go ahead and practice all this. Create your own type of poster working with these. You'll see how shapes are invaluable and they are a critical part of almost everything that you create. So we'll come back and we'll be working on type next to a more advanced degree. Let's now talk about color. Color is everywhere. It comes in every shade you could think of, does it not? That's what color actually is, every shade you could think of. And Photoshop with, will work with millions and millions of different colors. Photoshop works with colors, whether it's gonna be print or it's gonna be in the web. 
Okay, and you will see that we can save our colors, we can work with gradients, and you can see we can do so much with our colors in terms of the, the hue, the saturation, the brightness, all kinds of good stuff here. So if you'll notice here in the lower left, I have these little squares. They're gonna allow me to then pick my colors. So I can go ahead and double click on that and choose whatever color, whatever color I want. And remember, I can change my RGB value. That's gonna be good for what? For working with the web, something on screen. And I also have my CMYK and that's gonna be for print. Okay, and you'll notice I can very easily change this and notice that's gonna go up and down like that. You'll also see there's a hexadecimal values. Okay, sometimes your designer will give you hexadecimal values and say, well, this is what we're working with. And you can just type that in or you can type in your RGB values just like that, your CMYK values, and it'll change accordingly. Okay, you'll also notice that there's this really great feature to add to swatches. So if I love this color, I can very easily add this to my swatches and then save it for later on and it will always be there. So I'm gonna click on that and then right away it says, okay, wonderful. Okay, I'm just gonna call this Dave's Blue, okay? Do you wanna add this to your current library? We're not talking about that in this class, but just know that this is gonna save it to your Creative Cloud library. I'm gonna uncheck that, but this is gonna allow you to actually save it with other people. And you can also open it when you're going into another document and you can also see it, see it from document to document and also from program to program, saving it in the cloud. I'm gonna click okay. And now it takes me right back to this. We're gonna to go to our, our, our swatches in just a little bit. Okay, but now I'm good to go. I click okay. And now I'm ready to start just drawing some things out. So that's great, super easy. Now I have that there. You'll notice now how my properties panel now changes, giving me the option to then change my color based off of whatever I want. You'll notice here is a color picker again. I can choose it to that, click okay. Super easy. Notice there's also some recently used colors or some also some other colors that are preset swatches. Again, swatch is a saved color and I can just bam, apply it, apply it. And I'm good to go. Okay, very good. Let's choose something that's not so hard on your eyes. Fantastic. That is colors in a nutshell. Now let's just at least see what's going on with our swatches so we can see where those things are in fact saved. So if you don't see your swatches panel, you can always find it under window and then you'll see it alphabetical order. There are swatches and then my swatches now pops up here. Okay. And now I will see down in the bottom of this list is the swatch that I saved. Great. And if I want to do another color later on, okay, based off of this, I can easily get to that. I can access that no problem. So you can switch it from this back to this anytime I want. Okay, pretty cool. Save your colors, your designers, they tell you this is the colors we're using, save them as a swatch. Notice you can also organize your swatches. See that, you can actually put them into individual folders if you want to, okay? Let's call this Dave's XYZ, XYZ project, okay? And now let's move this inside of there. And now that lives inside of it and it's encapsulated just like all these guys have a little folder there to keep it nice and safe and organized. Okay. You'll also notice I can move this up if I want to and that's going to be there. So swatches are invaluable. Okay, so we've learned how we can create colors using RGB, CMYK, save our colors, also working with our hexadecimal code and also save those just the same. Now let's talk about kind of a different degree of working with colors, and that is gradients, gradients. So let's now, I'm gonna get rid of this right now, and I'm gonna start over from scratch. So I'm gonna dock this back up here. And now start creating something else. So let's take a look at what our other options are going to be as far as creating some type of gradients. So what is a gradient? Let's define what a gradient is first. So gradient implies that there's one color that's going to be melding into another color and Photoshop is gonna put those colors sort of in between. 
So you might have a color going from black all the way to white. So it's going to be this nice gradation of gray going from dark gray, less dark gray to a little more lighter gray all the way to white. And you can see it can create a nice little effect for things. So let's now draw out our same old square, but this time let's put in a gradient. So if you look up on top in my little control center up here, you're gonna see that I have this option to fill my color. But when I click on that, you'll see I get a lot of options we have not explored. We've already taken a look at this. We've looked at our swatches. There's my trusty old swatch I just created. But now we're gonna look at this little guy right here. This guy is gonna allow us to then create and edit our swatches. So I click on that. And you're going to see, excuse me, not our swatches, our gradients. Okay, so you're going to see here, I now have a whole bunch of gradient options available to me. I have a bunch of preset gradients that I can work with. And you can see here, there's a whole bunch of them. Now you can see what a gradient looks like. Fantastic, good. Maybe I want that. So if I click on that, you'll notice that underneath here, all of these little options change. These are known as our gradient stops. And you can see it's going from this kind of light, pretty purple all the way to this kind of like grayish blue. Check out some of these other ones. You can see how that changes dramatically. All right, so maybe I love this and I'm ready to go. So I've chosen it. I'll just go ahead and draw it out. Great, love that, amazing. But I'm not happy with it, okay? So I'm gonna click on this and I can see how I can change it in a very different way on many, many different levels. So you can see here, I'm going from this dark purple to this light blue. Now, if I don't want that color anymore, because this was just a preset, I can very easily change it just by simply coming over here to my little stop and double clicking it. See where I am here? I'm double clicking right there, and this pops right up to my color picker. So let's just choose red just for effect. You can see, ooh, that's kind of nice. And you can see what it's doing there. Like you're kind of creating maybe a little backdrop, you know, for, you know, just like a sky, something like that. Maybe there's a fire, maybe there's lights happening in the background. Maybe you're just kind of creating something kind of ethereal. I love that. That's great. Now, you'll also notice that when I click on this, I get this little diamond. This diamond allows to control where some of the red kind of begins and ends right you see that how it kind of stretches out a little bit more so i get more red this time so i'm going to click and drag this way this time i get less red see you have that, all that control in the world to then control how your gradient's going to be i'm going to keep this in the middle let's take a look at some of our other options i'm going to start over here on the right hand side and look at this one pretty simply all this does is reverse the gradient i click on that and then it just makes the red go up on top. You'll notice to the left of this is another option. It's like a little clock. It says, okay, well, which direction is this coming in? This is like a you know, 360 degree angle here. So you can see, well, I want it to come this way now. So you can make it so it's going to rotate the gradient. Let's do that way. And then that also is another way to make it go in a different direction. So a little bit more sort of dynamic do something like that, okay? Now, here is something that you may want to explore for sure, where you have the different types of gradients. Right now, we're working with what's known as a linear gradient. Now, if I click on this little dropdown, you'll see I can change this to a radial angle reflected diamond, okay? Most likely, it's just gonna be these two that you're gonna work with more than anything. So I'm gonna change this to radial, and you can see, oh, it's kind of cool. Let me switch that around. Ooh, I like that even better. Okay, so just imagine you're gonna have something kind of in the center of your document and you really wanna kind of spotlight it. A radial gradient can really, really go a long way. Okay, so really cool stuff, really fun. So let's just see this in action. I'm gonna go back to my Iceland postcard and let me just drag this. I'll show you a nice little trick here. I'm gonna drag this guy up into my tab, bring it back down. Say yes, and then look at that. Now I've got a nice little feature that I can show, hey, bam, there it is. There's my image and I'm really kind of drawn to it all because of gradients. Okay, so really practice that. Practice 
saving swatches, saving your colors, putting in different colors, talking to your designers, putting in different CMYK, RGB, and then again, saving your swatches, organizing your swatches, and then come back and start working with gradients and manipulate them as much as you need to, working with the linear gradient, working with our radial gradient, and then manipulating the diamond, and then um, seeing what you like, right? Just know that you have all the control in the world. And like with all of our exercises, I recommend pausing the video for a little bit, practicing till it works for you, until you feel comfortable, and then move on to the next exercise, okay? Have fun and we'll see you in the next activity. For this next lesson, I wanna make sure that you have open the C text and box.psd and also the poster with shapes and text lesson three. Um, so what we're gonna be looking at here in this particular document is um, all the different settings we can do within type. Right, so you've already learned how we can bring in type. Just go ahead and click on the T and click on your text box and drag it out. And then you essentially are setting the confinements of this text box. So you can see when I click on this, this is the confinements of this text box. Mm -hmm. And it brings in this filler text. Okay, great. And you can see here's another one, has a little T there. It's great. Now, how can we adjust things on the next level? We already talked about all the different fonts we can change to. Right, we can see if I double click back on here, I have all my font options right up here. Okay, that's great. You'll also notice a few other additional options for playing around with my alignment. And you'll also see that there's a new one that we have not worked at, looked at yet, which is this little icon here that's gonna open up to my character and my paragraph. So you'll see there's a lot, a lot of different options we can work with here, character and paragraph, etc., and then I can go ahead and dock that just the same. So it's a really nice, easy way of getting into my type options. Another option, and that's what we're gonna work on uh, together right now, is working with the properties panel. We've discussed the properties panel last session when we were talking about working with our shapes, how this is a great one-stop shop for all of your things that you work with, depending on the context of what you've clicked on. So when I'm working with my type, Notice how my properties now change. If I click on my image, notice how my properties change. So it's really nice about the properties panel is that I can then very easily go from one object to the other, yet still not have to open up to another panel, right? So properties panel is really fantastic. So I want you to see that when I click on this particular uh, set of type, I have an option here for my character and also for my paragraph, saving me the trouble of having to open up to the character and paragraph panel. Okay, so hopefully you can see the value of working with the properties panel. So why are we here? What are some things you might wanna work with on this particular document? We've already done all of our characters and you know our fonts and everything like that. We can see here's our size, but what are some other things that we might be concerned with? I want you to notice here, there is going to be our letting, our kerning, and our tracking. What are these things? Let's just first focus on letting. Letting simply defined is just simply line spacing. So if I were to change this now to 30, notice how I get a lot more line spacing. Okay, a lot more space between my type. I'm gonna go ahead and just make that come up a little bit more, maybe a little bit tiny bit less. Okay, great. I love that. So, and just notice how I did that in my properties panel. I didn't have to select all the text. I just work with a text box. And also we learned about what is letting, right? Pretty great. Let's now take a look at this ocean text box right here. And you'll see that this is 103 point font. Okay, that's great. And you'll also notice that my type is kind of touching each other a little bit. Okay, because it's not like a normal set of text where it has like regular spacing apart. That is known as my tracking. Okay, my tracking. Do you see this here? Tracking. So let's just set this back to zero. And you can see, okay, that looks pretty normal. And I'm going to go ahead and go negative. And you can see how you can do a very creative way of overlapping things, making them far apart if you want it to be perfectly spread out. 
Great. Look at that. Really nice. Very kind of visually interesting, if you will. Now let's talk about kerning. Kerning is very much like tracking, but it only works from like one letter to the other. So if I bring this down, see that? Bring that down. It's only going from the C to the E because that one actually didn't track very well. So I had to go to kerning. So I had to move my cursor between the C and the E and then make that change. So really cool, really slick, gives you a lot of control over your content. So that is letting, tracking, and kerning. Gives you the space between the entire set of paragraphs, all the line spacing, the entire words, which is gonna be tracking, and then the entire letters, which is going to be kerning. Now let's talk about some of our paragraph settings here. You'll see my paragraph settings. Some things may be hiding, by the way. If you click on these three dots, you'll see, oh wow, more options are coming up for me. Oh, that's great. Okay, same thing for my character. If you don't see what you're looking for, you can always find additional options here. If you wanna go a step further with your horizontal or vertical scaling, maybe your color if you wanna to get to that. A lot of the same things you're gonna be found up here in our tools as well, but always kinda of take the bait for these three little dots here. In this case, for our paragraph, we may wanna see certain things here, like for this particular one. Let me go back to my Laura Mipsum. And I might want to adjust where things are coming in from the left margin. Very easily, I can control that. Maybe I want to have a first line indent. Very easily, I can do that. So every single paragraph in that box will then get indented. See how easy that is? Very, very slick with just a couple of clicks to be able to do that right here in this spot right here. If you don't want hyphenation, you can change that. So lots and lots of options there, okay? Then you have some other potential, a little bit more kind of obscure options. Like if you wanna have everything in all caps, you can do that, or everything in small caps, you can absolutely do that. If you wanna underline, if you wanna do superscript, subscript, some ligatures, all kinds of different options here. Okay, so definitely check those out. But if you're more comfortable, again, with working with the character and paragraph style, all the options are here. It's literally the same exact options, with the exception of that the properties panel keeps them all in one place for you so you don't have to go back and forth between panels. Okay, so just remember the benefit of that. Now let's just check out this one here, and this could be certainly one that you practice on if you want to. So you can see here is one particular set of text, a little bit smaller, maybe a little more manageable, and I can see what I can work with on my line spacing, in other words, my letting, can very easily control that. And then maybe I wanna play around with my tracking. So this will give you something to practice on before our next lesson. Have fun. In this next lesson, we're gonna learn about something pretty awesome called clipping masks. What we're looking at here is something called a text clipping mask. You'll see here is an image clipping mask and a few other examples as well. So how do we create this? If we look at our layers panel, it's nothing too complicated. Take a look at this one for our image, nothing too complicated. So we're gonna learn how we can create this from beginning to end and you'll see that something pretty magical and pretty amazing can be created very quickly and easily. Okay, so how do we do it? I'm just gonna go ahead and create a new document. It's gonna be landscape and blank ready for me to then bring in my image. It's the first thing we're gonna do. Very simply, I'm gonna place in my giraffe image. You should all have access to this. And just a little bonus, let's talk about how we can make this fill in the screen without having to do too many clicks and drags. Earlier, we looked at how we can click and drag just from the corner, but let's say I wanna have this come in from the center and going outward. If I hold down the Shift and the Alt key from the corners, look at that, that comes in right from the center. Wonderful, that fits in there perfectly. And now I'm going to draw out some type. I'm gonna just go to my type tool and just click and drag going all the way from one side to the other. I'm gonna type out Africa. Okay, great, 
And now I can then play around with some of my options that we learned about in the last exercise that's going to allow me to have more control over this. And we're also going to learn a few bonus ones as well. All right. So notice how it's way off. Sometimes Photoshop will do that regardless of what I do. It decides to kind of center it right on the top. So I'm going to work with my, my baseline. So I can have that come down a little bit. I also want to work with my scaling, my scaling. So if you see here, I have my horizontal scale and my vertical scale. See that? There's my vertical scale. Here's my horizontal scale. In this case, because I want this to be kind of nice and blocky, I really want to kind of make it act as a frame. The font I choose and how kind of blocky I make it is going to be very important. So using these two guys, our vertical scale and our horizontal scale can be really, really valuable for us. All right. So, and again, I can change this anytime I want to as well. All right. And if you want to play around with the tracking, you can do that just the same. So let's just see how do we in fact make this into a clipping mask, right? That's why we're here. First thing you want to do after you've completed everything is make sure that your object, right? Meaning your image is above your type. Okay, or above the thing you want to clip to. Okay, I know it seems counterintuitive because looking at this, it kind of seems like the opposite is happening. When in fact, you want your image to be up on top. And all we're going to do now, and this is very important here, you're just going to do Alt okay, between the two layers. So what do I mean by that? Alt and then click. So you'll see what that is. And then you've very, very quickly and very, very easily created a clipping mask. So watch this. I come between the two layers. I hold down Alt and then notice what appears here. Watch what happens when I let go of Alt. See? Hold that down and watch what happens when I click. Magic. Just like that. I'll do that one more time. Hold down the Alt key. Move your mouse right between the two layers. And now we've done a clip. And if I want to get those extra effects, super easy to do. We've already covered that. I'm just going to put a very simple stroke around this. Maybe go a little bit thicker. Great. Love that. Amazing. And what's so neat about this is that these are still independent of each other. I could move my giraffe a little bit this way, a little bit that way. See that now? He's in the A as well. So you have a nice, really cool effect to work with. Wonderful. Now, let's see how we can do the same thing for an image. So type sort of naturally clips to things, whereas an image may not so much. So let's do a quick little exercise in how we do that. So this time I'm going to just open to my Romanian castle. And I'm just going to bring in my shape this time. I'm going to go ahead and place embedded. And I'm going to find this Romanian map. Say, OK, great. Now what, what happens? So earlier we talked about bringing our image up above. And let's just see what happens when we're not doing the complete process here. Bring my image up above, just like Dave said. Hold down the Alt key in between the two layers. Click. And then, oop, not what I expected. Hmm, let me undo. What's happening here? Remember how type has a natural sort of clipping ability, right? Because type by itself has like these grooves around it. What we need to do is play around with our image to make it so all of this stuff goes away. We learned about this earlier on about working with the quick selection tool or working with the magic wand tool. So before I do anything, I need to rasterize this. I no longer has a little icon there. I'm going to go over here to my quick selection tool. I'm just going to click very slowly coming around the edge, coming around here. Okay, great. Notice how it's not affecting the other layers, right? Just because that's just how Photoshop works does not affect the other layers. Great, let's make sure we get anything here. Good, and then I hit delete. 
Control D, that's great, it's wonderful. Certainly you can get rid of some of these little watermarks there if you like. Now I'm ready to go because again, think about the parallel between type and this map now. It does not have this little white background. So if you're planning on doing something like this, you need to make it so it has like these little clean lines so it's no longer that square because that's what it looked for. Look for the outline of that. So let's bring this up top and hold down the Alt key right in between the two layers and wonderful. Cool. That looks really, really slick. Okay, if you know what Romania looks like, if you know about Romanian castles, you'd be very excited. Now, the last thing we're going to do here is, well, how did I get that effect? That's pretty cool. And oh, what about these little shadows? Oh my God, wow, there's a lot going on here, but not a lot on the layers panel. So something really simple is happening. What am I doing? I'm just gonna bring down the opacity of layer zero so I can very gently see what's underneath it. Ah, oh, wow, that is really cool. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to my Romanian map. And then we haven't really done too much with drop shadow, so let's just add on a drop shadow to this. Give it a little bit of texture so you can see shadow off, shadow on, shadow off, shadow on. Let's keep that on. I'm gonna make that a little bit darker so you can see it. Bring down the size a little bit. That's kind of cool. See that, it gives us some nice texture and I'm pretty happy with that. So go ahead, I'm gonna pause the video. Please practice that, enjoy. In the last lesson, we talked about clipping masks. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about just plain old masking, plain old masking. And if I were to give you any advice as Photoshop beginners, I would say learn about masking to the nth degree. If you wanna master really anything, you will see that masking comes in so many, so many different forms. You're gonna see it's gonna give you a lot of power over things in many, many different facets of Photoshop. This is just gonna be the beginning of how we can mask things. This gives you control of what you wanna see and what you don't wanna see. That's essentially the definition of what masking is. Essentially, do I wanna see something? Do I wanna not see something? It could be an object, but it could be an effect. It could be a filter, it could be a layer adjustment, it could be certain colors, right? And we're gonna get into some lessons on that in a little bit, but right now we're gonna focus on just like basic masking. So you'll see that this very unusual, beautiful creature here is the product of masking. You'll see over here that there's actually two different layers overlapping each other. And you'll also notice how there is this new little layer happening here that's connected to this lion layer. Okay, what's actually happening here? There is a mask that is happening that is poking through this lion's face to show through so this little doggy can come through the lion's face. But it gives me all the control in the world to show what I want, how much I want to show, okay? You'll also notice that, okay, it's not perfect, so I can very easily fix that. The two things I want you to take away with masks are very simple. It's going to be black, or white and using the brush tool, believe it or not. All right, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit, but it's gonna be black or white while using the brush tool. Notice these colors here are black or white. So let's just do an example of this. You can watch me and then practice it and then practice it on your own now. When I talk about masking, I also want you to note that masking is a very, good alternative, if not the best alternative for deleting something. Earlier, we discussed the eraser tool. Rather than erasing sometimes, you might wanna consider just masking because masking, guess what, is not permanent. Or erasing is permanent, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, without further ado, let's open up to our file, so I'm gonna bring in the dog. I'm going to place the lion. All right, and there we have it. Now, don't worry about getting everything perfect right now. And we're also gonna learn about how to crop some things a little bit, just the same. All right, I'm gonna unlock everything. Good practice. 
And what I'm going to do next is mask. I'm going to put a mask on this line. I want you to think about masking in terms of masking or blindfolds, right? So sometimes you're going to have a blindfold, you poke a hole in it, it becomes a mask. Okay, just imagine that. Just put a blindfold over your face and then you poke a hole in it and it becomes a mask, right? You're turning into, into Robin, you're turning into the Green Lantern, okay? So that's what we're going to do next. Where do we find our ability to mask? That is going to be down here. Move your mouse over, it'll tell you. Add a layer mask. Cool, we haven't done those yet. So let's click on this and we're gonna choose add layer mask and then that thing pops up just like how we saw before, right? This one has that there, but it's got some little black brush lines on there. And that's what we're gonna do next. So remember the first two things I talked about, black or white. So right now this is white, okay? So white is gonna conceal, black is going to reveal. So let's just see what we can do now. So the brush tool can be easily accessed either by clicking on the brush itself or guess what? Shortcut key of B, that's what I like. And you'll see here I've got two colors here. It's either gonna be black or white, black or white. If they're not black or white, you can very simply just click on that and that'll actually set it to be the default and you can switch it around if you want to as well. But we want whatever color we're gonna be playing around with right now to be on the foreground. And in this case, it's going to be black because we wanna see what's underneath there. We wanna reveal what's underneath there, which is gonna be the dog. So take a look at my brush size, which is 125. Also take a look at the hardness, which I have it as 0%, which I want, because I don't want it to be like hard lines. I want to kind of blend in nicely, okay? And again, if you want to adjust your brush size, who remembers this? Right bracket, left bracket, right bracket, left bracket, on your keyboard, that is. All right, so I'm gonna make them a little bit smaller, bring it down to 100, and now I'm just gonna draw with my brush tool black. And it's gonna make sure it's very important you're not selecting the lion, you're selecting the layer mask. Then I click and drag, and now I can see I'm making a nice little reveal of the dog, but uh-oh, it's not coming in as great as I'd like. Why is that? You wanna take a look at your opacity just the same. So if your opacity is not 100%, it's gonna come in kind of weak like this. So I'm gonna make mine 100%. Okay, now I'm just cutting right through the lion. Okay, where is the lion gonna become a dog? All right, okay, not too bad, but there's something missing here. Not doing exactly what I want. The dog's just really not in place, is it? So I can click on the dog layer. The dog layer is still independent, just like how we saw with the clipping mask. Go back to my move tool. Remember, we wanna think about these tools just like we do anything else, right? We have to change tools to accomplish different goals. So I'm gonna bring that little guy down below, starting to look a little more realistic. Maybe I'm just gonna shrink him in a little bit. Okay, you don't want to see the top of his head. Just like blend it in nicely. And if you don't like what you've done, you can always do, guess what? Paint white over it. So let's just see the opposite now. Let's just see what happens when I paint white with my brush tool over here. See, that goes away. Go back to black, switch it, and then just very gradually just have some of the lion, some of the dog. See that? Ooh, okay. Kind of nice. Ooh, I've got a little bit too much. Switch it out back to black. Then bring back some of the lion. Bring back some of the lion. See that? So you'll be seeing lots and lots of examples on how you might want to do this. You might want to bring in something that you only want to just show something from the background a little bit to peek through. Right? You want to have that kind of control. Maybe you want to do it in a kind of gradual way just to sort of display something where something just comes in in such a way. Okay, it just kind of gradually appears. Okay, so or you can do something like that. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So now I was a little creative with it. Notice I'm like half dog, half lion. Or maybe it's the opposite. So I go there and then I switch it where I'm like, okay, 
Now it's a cute little lion with some dog eyes. You can see the difference there, okay? So there's a lot of creative ways to do this, okay? And then in a future lesson for my advanced class, I show you how to use gradient masks. And then when we start talking about adjustment layers, we're gonna be using uh, masks in a little bit of a different way. So stay tuned and please practice that. Welcome back from your exercises. Next thing we're gonna talk about is adjustment layers. There are a number of adjustment layers that we can work with. We've already been looking at one particular adjustment layer and that is just bringing in a solid color. There are several different types of adjustment layers we can be working with. So understand what an adjustment layer is actually doing. We are putting an adjustment onto the layer, meaning that we're not actually affecting the layer itself. So if I wanted to make this black and white, I can make this black and white, but I'm not actually affecting the pixels themselves. It's non-destructive, it's not affecting this at all. So for example, if I were to make this black and white, you'll be able to see very quickly, a new layer now appears here, and it actually shows me it is black and white right on top of it. Now, if I were to click on this little eyeball right there, you can see it can turn that on, turn that off again, turn that on, turn it off again. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different adjustment layers that we can do. So we're gonna be exploring a handful of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and undo what I just did. Okay, and there we are back to this. Now I have this lovely, lovely peacock photo, but I wanna make it a little bit more lovely. I wanna kind of bring out some vibrancy to it. One of the first adjustment layers that I like to work with is what's known as the levels, the levels adjustment layer. What are levels? The name implies three different types of levels. We have our highlight levels, we have our midtone levels, and we have our shadows. So within this document, you're gonna see there's lots of different lighting in there. We have the opportunity to be able to adjust and manipulate each of those individual levels, as opposed to, let's say, exposure or brightness and contrast, which basically blasts the whole thing out. So I recommend the first thing, if you ever wanna improve a photo, go over here to your levels. So I'm gonna go ahead and try that out, see what that does. The first thing you're gonna notice is nothing happens, right? Second thing you're gonna notice is I have a new layer right on top of my original layer. Okay, and notice this says levels. So the next thing you're gonna notice is in my properties panel, I'm going to have a whole bunch of crazy things happening here. This is what's known as a histogram. It's basically showing me the distribution of lightness and darkness all throughout this image that I can now manipulate. And you'll notice here, I have my shadows, my midtones, and my highlights. Each of these things are represented here in the histogram, and I can also manipulate them by clicking and dragging on these little stops here. So let's just try this out. Notice how this is kind of an outlier. That's typically kind of like a first place I go if I don't know what to do. I just kind of go to the outlier and I say, well, let's just have this guy join his friends. Whoa, just like that, dramatically different photo. Let's bring this one in here. Bring in my highlights a little bit, and you'll notice that the highlights get affected, but nothing else really does, right? See, the lighter get lighter, the midtones, and only the midtones really get affected. It doesn't really affect the brightness. If you look at the brightness aspect, it doesn't really affect it. So pretty cool, very quickly and easily, I have a very, very different photo. I didn't do anything with color, but somehow, somehow it affected the color, which is pretty cool. So let's look at the original. Like, wow, just like that, got a brand new photo. So what I recommend is play around with your levels first and you'll see how easy that is, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about a lot of masking in this lesson, okay? And this whole lesson on adjustment layers. We've already done masking where we mask the dog and the lion. Masking also applies when you're working with adjustment layers. So let's say, for example, I didn't want a certain part of this peacock to have the adjustment layer of, of levels. Okay, what could I do? Remember this little white box here, how that indicates a mask? And also remember how there's three elements. There is the black, the white, and the brush. Okay, so I can just simply brush black to reveal what's underneath there to then show what I wanna show. 
Okay, so this one actually looks pretty great, but let me just show you just for, you know, different for, you know, the purpose of this exercise to be able to see what we can do to control it. And we're going to see several different examples of this. So I'm going to go to my brush or I can just click on the B. And then I'm going to choose black. So just like I did with my original masking, I can then poke through this mask to make my blindfold into a mask using black with my brush tool. So let's just see how that works. I simply click right here on the thumbnail and then let's just do a little swipe right through this and you'll see the original, original color comes through. Let me go ahead and just switch this out and then I can bring that right back and you'll see that it gets a little black line there. So it gives you all kinds of control. You don't have to think like, oh, wait a second, that part doesn't look good, but the other one does. You'll see lots and lots of different examples, like somebody may have like a shadow over their eye, but then we have to fix the rest of the document in order to affect that one. Like, oh my God, no, you can have control over just one part of the document. Again, we're gonna be looking at several different examples of this moving forward, but this is just the, our first adjustment layer and also working with masking on a third level that we haven't seen yet before. Okay, and earlier I said that masking is invaluable. That is gonna be one of the number one things you want to master when you're looking, when you're working with Photoshop on many, many levels. So as long as we understand the black and white, the brush and the masking layer, you'll do great. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video, go ahead and practice, and we're gonna come back and we're gonna do a number of other different kinds of adjustment layers. And next up in our adjustment layer discussion is going to be around curves. Curves are a little bit more nuanced than levels, but they have the same concept in mind when you're working with the different levels, right? We have different levels that we discussed earlier when we have our shadows, our midtones, and our highlights. Okay, but curves are gonna give you a little more of kind of fluidity. But I'm gonna just show you some shortcuts around this. Rather than having to kind of like fake it till you make it, I'm gonna show you some nice little tips around this. So this is our original, and this is gonna be kind of our goal. So if you kind of adjust your eyes to the newness of it, you can see how we can be a little more creative with our color adjustment. So it's kind of nice, looks a little more interesting, a little more crisp, a little more vibrancy, okay? A little more sort of dynamic and kind of a chrome quality. So what can we do with this? So if we take a look back where we were, you see I just have a very simple curves adjustment. And you can see here what my curves look like here. Okay, so how did we actually get this to do this? And how do we get it so it didn't affect anything else on here? Let's go back to our original, my Cuba one. And I'm going to add on a new type of adjustment layer, which is just curves. Now. There's a lot we can do here, right? Just so you have an idea, this is my curve. This is going from, you know, my shadows all the way to my highlights. And I can go in and click on anywhere on here and I can really manipulate this. I don't really know exactly what I'm doing necessarily. I can kind of play around with it. And I'm creating like several different points here and you can definitely, definitely experiment. I highly recommend experimenting kind of to see what it does. But I'm gonna go ahead and undo all that. So I come right back to this, but I do want you to see how all that works in case you were curious on it, you've seen somebody else's stuff and how we're gonna see how we're gonna manipulate it and maybe a little bit more direct way, a little more nuanced, a little more automatic. And that is working with this guy right here. I love, love, love this tool right here because it allows me to directly uh, target a particular part of it right, of the actual document. You can see click and drag an image to modify the curve. So when I click right here directly on this yellow, notice how the little histogram, my little curve there, see how it moves around, I go to here, it goes to a different part of it, I go to here, right, a very, very different part of it, the darkness, the lightness, okay, and then less light. So I can then control just that element of it just by simply clicking and dragging. You can see they're all getting lighter, they're all getting darker. See that? So everything that has like that level of like lightness or whatever in it is then getting affected. Okay. But you'll notice that she's getting affected as well. Her windows are getting affected. Okay. It's like, okay, so I'm going to want to adjust that somehow where I'm going to have some more control over that. So, okay, maybe I love this. You know, maybe I can kind of keep going with it. Okay. Maybe I really like that. You know, just kind of play around with like different parts 
of your document to see, okay, well, what do I want to control? Notice how my whites are getting a lot whiter now, but my yellows are not. She's not getting affected by it. I have that kind of control over it, right? It's all about control, all about color correction for what you want to have actually corrected and edited. All right, great. So I can bring that up a little bit more. Now, I do not want her to be affected at all. She looks fantastic. So what I'm going to do is put on a mask. Okay, so the mask is already here, so I should rephrase that. I'm going to actually reveal what's underneath here. So we know that already. Let's go over here to our brush. I'm going to make sure this is selected right there on the mask itself. And then I want to poke a hole through my blindfold to make a mask so I can reveal what's inside of here because I want to see her, right? She's great. She's kind of the star of the show here. So I really want to make sure that I can see her. It's pretty nice, but maybe I also want to see like her window here as well. Okay, but maybe not as much. So what I can do is I can manipulate the opacity of how strong that's coming in. So I'm going to get a little bit of the adjustment layer, a little bit of that curves, and then a little bit of what's originally there. So I can bring that down very easily to let's say 50%. So it's just gonna be just a slight, slight little modification, just not so much. Okay, all right, so it's a little more kind of subtle there. So if we look at the original, we can see not so bad. Pretty cool, let me zoom out a little bit. That's a pretty nice photo at the end of the day. Okay, maybe we'll bring out a little bit more of this. Maybe there's some more kind of lurking back there I lost. Okay, and then you can come back here and manipulate anytime you want. So if you want to bring back the actual curve one more time to do that again, you can just simply click directly on this icon and it comes right back up and then you can manipulate any part of this. You can even delete them if you want to just by simply selecting them, hitting the delete key or hitting the little trash icon. Okay, so really powerful stuff. Not only working with curves, but of course, working with the mask. So I'm gonna pause the video. Please go ahead and practice. Maybe find one of your own photos that you wanna improve, you wanna be a little more creative with. Let's continue this discussion of adjustment layers, but this time we're gonna talk about the black and white adjustment layer. We're gonna do a little more masking, but then we're also gonna add on different levels to our adjustment layer. So we're gonna have multiple happening at the same time. So very simply, we're gonna make this into black and white. How does that work? Really nicely and easily. I select my layer, I go to my black and white cookie down there and go to my black and white adjustment layer and you can see, fantastic, that's great. Is that exactly what I want? Not entirely. But you'll see that there's actually a number of presets that I can play around with, right? So you can see, let's just see what the high contrast blue filter does. Okay, maybe not exactly what I want. Let's go back to the default. Let's go to darker. Oh, that's not so bad. But you'll notice that it actually changes things, right, that I could be doing manually, but I just want you to see what it does. You'll also notice that we have a little hand here, just like how we just saw in the last one, where you can maybe only want to work on one part of that to make that part black and white, right, and make that kind of manipulated. Now let's understand what exactly is happening here because notice how we have these colors like red, yellows, greens, and cyan, and blue. What is that actually even referring to? Because none of that is on this image. It's referring to the original information that we started with. So it's only playing around with the reds, yellows, and greens, et cetera, of what we see in the original image. Okay, so for example, I'll just bring my reds up a little bit more to be a little bit darker. And you'll notice how that comes through the black and white filter a little bit darker as well. So you can see, wow, that gets a lot more crisp, a little more interesting. Let's just see, pretty cool. Okay, all right, make our yellows a little lighter, but yet our reds a little bit darker. We have a very interesting dynamic happening here. Okay, and mostly in this image, we're gonna see the reds and the yellows are gonna be affected. Let's make the yellows a little bit darker, probably not so much, but really depends on the look you are trying to achieve. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep it like this. You can always come back and make changes too, but just note what it's actually doing. Great, so I'm done with that. Now, earlier, we've been talking about masking. Let's say I wanna go a little bit more interesting with this. Like these flowers are beautiful, and I want her to remain black and white. 
Maybe I want to make her lips shine through, her eyes shine through. I can very, very easily do that, right? Her eyes, yeah, it might work for her eyes as well. I might want to just, just manipulate these to a certain extent to make it so the flowers are coming through and then maybe I want to change the color of the flowers. Well, how can I do that? This is where masking comes in once again, but I'm going to show you a neat little trick for masking. So let's click on the background layer because I want to select these flowers. So I'm going to use my quick selection tool and I'm going to do this relatively quickly because you can see Photoshop does a pretty decent job of this. But what I want you to, to know about working with mask is that it doesn't really matter because you can always come back and fix your mask. Remember masks are non-destructive, so you don't have to worry about it. We're not deleting anything and we can always come back and add more to it, whatever you'd like to do here. Okay, so come back to here. Okay, that's great. And I intentionally kind of forgot that so I can show you how we can fix it later on. So what I'd like to do is poke a hole in this blindfold to make it a mask. So very simply, all I do and wait, ready for this, I'm gonna hold down the Alt key or the Option key, okay? While clicking on this and then hitting Delete. And then bam, that comes away and then bam, it pokes a hole right into this. Okay, so again, what did I do? I hold, held down the Alt and Option key and then clicked on the mask itself and then hit Delete on my keyboard. And now I'm gonna deselect, like, oh, that is pretty cool. Very interesting. Okay, maybe I'm gonna zoom in, potentially work on her lips. Let's just see here. And again, I might not get it perfect. I'm gonna go into here. I don't really wanna mess with her teeth so much. And zooming in is really kind of an important thing here. So I'll make, I'll make my brush a little bit smaller. You know what, for right now, I'm just gonna keep it kind of rough because we can see how we can play around with this. So again, let's do the same thing. Great, love that. Okay. Now she's looking like she had a bad bad time with her lipstick, right? They got into a little war. So we're gonna be able to fix that really nicely and easily by guess what? Instead of painting with black, we're gonna paint with white. Okay, so let's zoom in and let's just really get in close to that. So I'm gonna hit the B key for my brush and let's fix it. Nice, not permanent. Bring up my opacity, it's just a little stronger. Come right to the edge. Yep, no problems at all. There's no lipstick on her teeth. Okay, that is much, much better. Really cool look, really cool effect. I'm gonna switch back. And by the way, if you hit the X key on your keyboard, that switches back and forth between the black and white. That's a nice little pro tip that will help you as you're working on these things to really, really be very fluid with it. Oops, no problem. I just hit the X key, right? Watch this. Oops, no problem. Okay. Clean that up a little bit. Okay. And of course, you'd come in and you'd manipulate a little bit more. Maybe I'll get rid of some of those black shadows, add a little bit more of her original lips. And maybe you don't want that at all. Okay. Now, going to the next level, let's see what we can do with these flowers and maybe even her lips. Okay. So, Let's see, I'm actually gonna get rid of her lips now that I'm looking at it. <laughs> so no problem at all. So I'm gonna hit the X key and let's just come back to there. Okay, great. But maybe you wanna do the same thing with her eyes. You can do with her eyes to make those sort of shine through. So hit the X key and then her eyes, that's kind of cool. All right, I like that. All right, awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, so now that I have this all set up, let's go to the next level and see what we can do to make the color changes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose the background layer, click on my adjustment layer, and we're gonna play around with the hue saturation adjustment layer. So now notice how I have two different adjustment layers happening here. And there's actually three things happening in hue saturation, there's hue, there is saturation and then there's lightness. Okay, hue is just the color, saturation is the degree of color, and then brightness, lightness is just gonna be how light is that color, whatever it is, gonna be coming in, coming in. So if we wanna play around with these, I can very easily make a change to these, but oops, that's not working at all how we want it to. 
So let's bring that back to zero. Easier to type it in sometimes. Thank you, Photoshop. Okay, so you'll notice that when I actually do this, as I showed you a second ago, we have a problem. Why is it doing what it's doing? It's affecting the entire layer that's underneath here. I want to actually only work with whatever's been masked. So the order of the layer is very important. So now let me go ahead and play around with that. And now you'll notice that only my flowers are getting affected. See that? And her eyes are getting affected. So now notice I'm getting a little more green and look how cool that is. Let's go this way and see that her eyes, the purple is matching the purple. Wow, very cool, excellent. So very important little lesson here. The ordering of the layers, especially when you have a mask, is very important. Before, when I had it down below, it was affecting the entire layer. All right, so you'll definitely want to practice that. You'll want to practice not only applying these adjustment layers, masking, but then also bringing in an additional one to play around with it, okay? So, because this part can be a little bit tricky. So now when I click on saturation, I'm going to make those things even brighter. See that? Ooh, that's kind of cool. Okay, so I play around with my lightness. Let's go ahead and see what we can do here. And that affects the entire image down below. And that is pretty neat. So let's look at our original. So we started pretty beautiful photo, but then if I add on that and then I add on that, that becomes a lot more interesting. Okay, so I'm sure you have lots of photos to work with kind of doing this type of masking out for black and white, some color, and then also making some adjustments to each of them in terms of your hue and your saturation and a little bit of your lightness and see where you go with that. Okay, and this particular um, image has a lot of colors on it. If it was just one color, like somebody's eyes, you know, or a background, something like that, you might have a different experience with it because this has like, you know, pink and kind of a violet color and this sort of like burgundy-ish color. So we're gonna have a little bit of a different experience than you might, but certainly experiment, have fun with it, and um, we'll break for a little bit and we'll come back and I believe let's do one more adjustment layer after this. Let's conclude our discussion on adjustment layers by again, doing a multiple uh, set of adjustment layers. Um, but I'm gonna actually add in a few more like vibrancy Okay, and I also want to kind of manipulate this little blue sky to make it a little more blue. Okay, so that's a nice little trick you're going to want to know about. All right, so let's just see what we can do based off of what we've already seen and then maybe add in one more. So let's go over to here. Let's go back to our curves again. And let's just say I would like to make this blue a little bit more blue. You can see that. Okay, that's great. Okay, not too bad. It's great. But guess what? I'd like to make this blue also a little more blue. Okay, so you can see how it's actually affecting that. Kind of nice, right? So it's a different blue than the original blue. And if we look back at the original, look how that blue sky really came to light. Kind of nice, I like that. Let's add on another one. Let's go over to here to Vibrance. So Vibrance is right here. And you'll see that Vibrance is broken down a little more simply to Vibrance and Saturation. So let's just see what we can do there. Very subtle with vibrance, but I think kind of necessary. It's like adding a little bit of salt to your document. You can see it's a little bit of salt to your meal. You can see a little bit there. Okay, it's kind of nice. Just sort of like fills in some missing pixels in you in a way. It does make it a little bit more sharper, a little more textured. And saturation, you can see more saturation, a little more blue, a little more orange that's in there. Cool, kind of like that. And that sort of completes my photo, and I think to, to a certain extent, a little bit more, just having these little extra things in there. Okay, so vibrance and curves, and also going directly into um, what your target is, like for my sky, again, look at the difference for where my sky started, where my document started, and now look at it. Pretty amazing. All right, now if you didn't like how this, the car, maybe it's too dark or whatever it is, remember you can always mask it out. Okay, so please use all of these. They're incredible. Make sure to remember that you can mask. You're never stuck with anything. Remember how I did with the woman's lips. You can always take those things back, take them away, change your selection. Whatever you'd like to do on your document, you have so much control over the color, the vibrancy, 
Um, the lack of color desaturates something with black and white. You can change the colors in the black and white. So much you can do. This is really sort of like the the masterclass on color correction for all of these things here. So please practice that and we will move on to our next activity. This next section is gonna be all about touch up. Okay, we have an image here that clearly has lots and lots of problems. This poor demonic family is about to be exercised, so let's fix them up. This is gonna be our first lesson in touching up. Super easy to do. And that's essentially working with the red eye feature. So on my document, I have this little band-aid here, which is gonna be the gateway to all of my wonderful little touch-up tools, including the red eye tool. So let's go ahead and play around with the red eye tool. You'll see how easy that is. As Soon as I click on that, you'll notice I get a whole bunch of options here for pupil size and darken amount, okay? So how big is the pupil? How kind of big do you want it to kind of spread out into the pupil, right? Is there like a big issue with this, right? So it really needs to spread out further, or maybe it's a little more subtle. How dark do you want it to get? Again, it's about subtlety. This is typically a good place to begin and end. You probably don't really need anything more than that, but you're gonna see it's amazingly easy to execute. I like to really zoom in as I do this. Let's start with the dad, click, click, done, amazing. Notice I didn't even have to unlock the layer. Click, 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 done, and done. Demons be gone. Okay, practice that, and we'll come back with another touch-up tool. If you're looking for an alternative to working with the levels and the curves for lightening things up, working with our you know, mid-tones and our highlights and all that stuff, but you wanna be a little more kind of focused and manual, working with the dodge and burn tool or might be a good bet for you. So you can see here, I have my dodge and my burn tool. So the burn tool is gonna to make it darker, dodge tool is gonna to make things a little bit lighter. So you might wanna make her teeth a little bit lighter, her eyes a little bit lighter, okay? Or it might be the opposite where you might actually wanna make something a little bit darker. Okay, so you never know. Right, so we'll try to find something on here that maybe we're gonna to wanna to make something a little bit darker. It's coming in, maybe somebody has the sun in their eyes, something like that, right? Maybe there's something in the background. You might wanna make that a little bit darker to kind of bring that into focus. So we have two layers here. I like to always have like kind of duplicate layers for something like this, by the way. Um, so you can always just click and drag holding on the Alt key to duplicate a layer. So kind of nice to be able to do that. Or you can do Command or Control J to duplicate our layers as well. So let's just do a nice little simple kind of touch up on her eyes where we're going to brighten them up a little bit. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, bring down my little mouse a tiny bit, and you'll see that when I click on my dodge tool, you will see here I have the range and I also have the exposure and I also have the option, do I want to protect the tones? Okay, so what am I affecting? Am I affecting the shadows, the midtones, the highlights? So highlights and part of this it's probably not so much it's probably going to make it a little bit too bright but let me see what that's going to do i can play around with my exposure i'm going to bring that up to 50 kind of be on the safe side and let's just see what that's going to do if i try to brighten this up a little bit let's see the before and after don't really see too much because there's not really any highlights in there so let's try the midtones is it identifying it that's a little better. There are more, there are more mid-tones in there, you can see, for after. Now let's try shadows, come back to here. I'll see, oh, that's not too bad actually, but maybe I don't want it so bright. So I can then bring this down a tiny, tiny bit, still affecting the shadows, but so now I don't want to lose any of the color in her eyes, like things like that. So maybe I'm just going to kind of just, just kind of just dabble a little bit. Okay, let's bring back to the original. Come back to here. And see my before and after. Okay, you always want to make these things kind of subtle. Okay, let's go ahead and do the same thing for this eye. Now that we've found what we like. Let's try maybe the mid-tones since this one looks a little bit lighter. Come out 
Oh, you can see her eyes are kind of sparkling a lot more than they were before. Okay. Nice effect, very subtle, and it gives you a lot of control. Let's maybe do something with her teeth. Teeth aren't bad, but maybe let's see what we can do. This is a very, very good example of how the, um, the dodge tool is used a lot. So this one can be really overdone. So we really want to make sure we're not overdoing it. So just keep that in mind. I'm just going to kind of go very, very subtle here. Just a couple of clicks. See what that's going to do. Go too far with it. Let's just kind of see it before, after. Not too bad. Understand kind of where whiteness is. It's kind of under, it's important to understand kind of the anatomy of things where like you're going to see probably a little more kind of darkness where like the thinness of the tooth comes in. You know, so it's kind of helpful to understand that. Okay, so again, let's look at the before and the after. Okay, subtle things like that really go a long way. Okay, so if you have things that are maybe a little bit too bright, like maybe she's got some harsh light coming over here, you might want to affect that. Maybe there's too much light coming over here, too much light coming over here. That's where the burn tool comes in. So you can do the opposite of this now. Right, where instead of making it lighter, it's gonna make it darker. So let's see what we can do with that. And now when I choose that, you'll see that I have similar options here. My range, what am I looking at? Shadows, midtones, or highlights, and my exposure. Let's start back around the 50 range and let's see what we can do to then maybe bring that down a little bit so our eyes are not so distracted by that brightness coming over there. We're still more focused on her eyes. So something like that where there's a little bit too much harsh light, maybe just like off the side of her face. See that? She's got just a little bit there. Just kind of tempers that a little bit. But see, we're doing it in a very kind of surgical way rather than working with our curves and our levels. We can now use the dodge and burn tool. Before, after for after. All right, so go ahead and practice that. Have fun, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Continuing on with our touch-up discussion, let's move on what's inside of this little area here, and let's go to our spot healing brush. This image clearly has a lot of issues. What can we do? Very easily, the spot healing brush allows us to get rid of each of these little dots here, some right there, right? Maybe some on his face, etc. This technology is called sampling. What is it actually doing? When I click on this, notice how it gets rid of it. Wow, amazing, look at that. That's where it was. Now I just simply click, it went away. The sampling technology understands that that is a blemish. So it finds all the things around that blemish and it says, hey, that must be good stuff, that's bad stuff. So let's just take all the bad, get good stuff and replace the bad stuff. Click, click, click. You can see, wow. Amazing. Now, if you see, there's my original. There is my new stuff right there. Okay, fantastic. Of course, I could be here all day working on these things here. Okay, that's great. Love that. Love that. Love that. Okay, great. Now, you will see that there's going to be a few other kind of like modifications on there. Of course, your brush size. Notice this is actually set to be content aware. That is what the sampling is. That's what's actually happening to make the, the brush tool do exactly what it's doing, okay? So the spot healing brush tool is fantastic. Let's see it now potentially to another degree. All right, we're gonna work on actual like people here. So I'm gonna zoom in and I'm looking at this document and my client says, listen, I'd love to kind of get rid of some of my crow's feet here, you know, maybe the lines in my forehead, but I wanna do it relatively subtly, okay? So what we're going to do in this case is we're gonna do it in a little more kind of fancy way where we're gonna create a blank new layer. So I'm gonna come down to the bottom. I'm gonna click on this little plus sign here, bottom of my layers panel, click on that guy right there. And I now have a new blank layer. And what's cool about this, this is gonna allow me to separate whatever changes I make from the original layer to be on this layer. Now, why would I wanna do that? Let's see that, okay? 
you're going to see why I want to do that. I'm going to click on this little option here to sample all layers. And then I'm going to come in and I'm just going to zoom in nicely. I'm just going to go ahead and just come in a little bit. Just like that. Okay, maybe that's a little bit too much. Okay, so let me just bring that down a little bit more. How's my hardness? Hardness is a little bit hard, so I'm gonna make that a little bit softer. Okay, again, certain things you wanna nuance a little bit. Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, let's go ahead and look at his forehead a little bit. Okay, just notice clicking and dragging or clicking. All right, and then I didn't do a really great job, did I? Because guess what? I can play around with that independently of where I started. See that? So lots of things I can do now. I can say, hey, listen, you know what? I don't want to do any of that. So let me go ahead and erase that. So make sure to go to my erase tool. I'm like, okay, you know what? Let's actually start all over again. That was really, really sloppy. So I can come back here and that's back to its original. And let's say I did like what I did on this one. Okay, however, what I'd like to do is maybe lighten it up a little bit, okay, where you can actually have like a little combination of what I did. So what I can do is bring down my opacity so it's still there, but it's not there, right? Let me just go ahead and really, really do this. Now watch this. When I bring down the opacity of this little touch-up layer, I'll be able to see some of the original, so you notice the before, right? And then after, so it's kind of there, but it's not there. But let's look at the before before. See that? So it's very, very subtle. So working with additional layers like this, where I actually place my touch up rather than placing directly on the image like I did with this one, allows me to have that kind of control where I can delete it, I can lighten it up with my opacity i can move it around i can rotate it there's so much you can do with it to have you give you that kind of control over it okay so combining my spot healing brush with putting in a new blank layer okay and then making sure you put in sample all layers very important gives you that type of control over where your touch up is going to go all right so go ahead and practice that up and then we will come back with some more touch-up tools. In this lesson, we're going to discuss a new type of touch-up, which is going to be the patching tool. So if we take a look at this document, we'll see that there are some desperate needs for patching up of these not-so-perfect tomatoes. Let's make them look perfect. So within our little section here of all of our touch-up, we're going to see the patch tool. Let's see this one in action. The patch tool, just like some of our other tools that we saw, are all about sampling. It's gonna basically kind of look for something that is good and replace the bad stuff with the good stuff, but it's gonna do it in a much more sort of like macro way. So let's find our sort of offending little blemish here and just draw a little shape around it with our patch tool, all right? That is no good, we need to fix it up, we need to repair it. And we need to find something that we want to repair it with. Now, just to kind of warn you what this is going to do, it's going to take a little bit what's over here, but it also kind of maintains the color and shadow and, you know, all the other sort of like dimension and tonality of the image of where this lives in here as well. So it doesn't do like an exact replica of it. It's quite smart. So let's just keep an eye on what I'm going to do. I'm just going to simply click and drag and just say, hey, can I borrow from you? Because I really like how you look. So I'm going to click and drag, let go, and deselect, and wow, amazing, right? You can never tell that there was any kind of blemish there at all. That's the patch tool. Let's maybe see that in action someplace else. Let's just see, like, I don't know, I'm just going to try this guy right here. All right, and I'm going to do it in maybe a little bit of a different way this time. I'm just going to click and drag on a square right here. Notice I'm marquee. And this time I'm gonna to go to my patch tool and then click and drag in this direction. And by the way, I'm holding down the shift key to do that, to keep it straight as I click and drag. And now I deselect and look at that. 
as if it was never there. See, believe it or not, it was there once upon a time. But then after marquee, I use my patch tool and just simply click and drag. And again, the way that I did it differently this time was instead of doing kind of just a more manual kind of rough selection, I used my marquee tool to be able to do that. All right, and then I'm gonna go ahead and deselect that. It's pretty great, looks amazing. All right, now let's talk about a few other things. Let's discuss a different type of touch up, right? A different type type of kind of, you know, image correction, if you will, where it's like, listen, I don't want certain things. What can I do to fix this? Okay, so let me just try it out. Let's just see, and we're gonna compare the patch tool to this one and see which one do we like better. So let's just say I have this picture. I don't really want this image here. Like what, I can get rid of that? Well, what can I do to get rid of it? I'm just gonna use my lasso tool to select the thing that I don't want. And I'm gonna come in relatively close and we're gonna see that we can select it just like that, come to the edge, okay, bam, that's where I started. We're gonna use something called the content aware fill option. I click on that and you'll see something's gonna pop up. And immediately, this all this green stuff comes around here. And then it also gives me this, like, oh, wait a second. What did it just do there? It gives me a little preview of what it could possibly do. So I'm gonna hit okay. And now deselecting, not too bad, not too bad, okay? Not 100% perfect, but it really got, actually got rid of a lot of the stuff. Let me go ahead and undo that. And let's compare it to working with the patch tool. I'm gonna to click and drag going this way. And then the difference here you'll notice is that as I click and drag, I'm able to get a little preview, this time including the little railroad lines that I missed out on the first time. I let go, deselect, wonderful. How very cool is that? Now it actually didn't miss anything. So that patch tool is pretty extraordinary. The Content aware fill is also pretty extraordinary, but I think in this case, the patch tool wins. Let's now try one more time. Let's try content aware fill. Who knows? Let's try it. Go over here to edit content aware fill. What's it going to do? Not too shabby. Click OK. Deselect. All right. So for certain things, content aware fill, and then for other things, the patch tool. So really excellent choices here. So sometimes one will be better than the other. Sometimes the others are gonna be a little faster. Okay, so try those both out. You can use this document, use your own documents, just figure out certain things you might not want. They're gonna be kind of large swaths of things. Let's just try one more, kind of pushing my luck here, but let's just see. I can try, there is that. Let's just move this up, make sure my layer is selected and then Let's see. Wow. Absolutely amazing. All right. So give that a shot. Have fun. Practice. And then we'll come back now with the clone stamp tool once we're finished. The clone stamp is going to be the next touch up tool we're going to discuss. An incredibly powerful tool for doing so much to your image, creating the illusion of something being there that was not there. Clone stamp tool lives right over here. We're gonna see that. And you're gonna see, it looks like a little stamp and you can access it just by hitting the letter S for stamp. You'll notice there that is. So I click on that, that's great. Now you're gonna notice that there's an option here called sample in my toolbar up on top where it says, what am I sampling? Yours may not say that. What we wanted to show is what is it sampling current and below? Because what I'd like to do is do something similar to what I did with my spot healing brush tool and make it so the thing that I'm going to sample and what I'm going to stamp are going to be on two different layers. So let's do exactly what we did in that exercise by creating a new layer. I'm going to call that cloned content. And I'm going to now start Cloning and stamping. So what does that mean? If we think about the term clone stamp, it's essentially giving us a little hint 
of what we're going to actually do. We are going to first clone something and then we're going to stamp it. Essentially is telling us step by step what to do. So how do we clone? How do we stamp? Okay, so as an example, let's say for example, I don't want to have any of these little railroads. So I want to clone something that's below it or above it or anywhere else and stamp right on top of it. So if you hold down the Alt or Option key on your keyboard, that is going to allow you to clone. Okay, and then you simply click to stamp. Easy as that. So let's check it out. Notice how I have these two layers here, right? I'm now selecting my cloned content because that's where I want my stamped content to go. And I come over to here to clone. So I'm going to clone this down here and simply stamp over here, clone, stamp, clone, stamp. I can even clone over here and stamp. Maybe let's get some of this dirt over here, clone. Okay, looks a little more natural, right? Those tracks were never there. Clone, stamp, clone, stamp. Look at that, I'm going crazy. Let's just finish it all out. A little bit of more rocks. Absolutely was never there. Let's do some of this dirt over here. Great, clone, stamp, etc. You can see how easy that is, okay? It's as if it was never there. Now, here's the beauty of this. This, all that stuff that I just cloned and stamped is on its own separate layer. This layer right here called clone content because that's what was selected and that is what I had chosen for my dropdown menu. So if I click on this, you'll see, I can always bring that back. And remember I brought down the opacity on the wrinkles. I can easily do that. Same thing, bring down my opacity. I can move these around, right? They're their own document now, they're their own element. I can even put them into my own document if I want to. Now let's go ahead and do this window here. So I'm going to clone this and stamp it elsewhere. So notice it gives me a little preview. I like, okay, now there's a new window here. Let's do it again. Clone, stamp. Now, if I really wanted to have control over this, I would maybe undo that and I put that on another layer altogether just for that window because in case it's like not perfect, I can then bring that to where I want it to be, okay? And that's what's the beauty of doing this because guess what? This is its own separate layer. I can now adjust independently and now that is completely in my control of where I want it placed because this is its own layer. So you've learned how to do clone and stamping on the most basic level, but I want you to learn it on a more kind of nuanced, advanced and more sophisticated level so you do it the right way so you have the most amount of control over all of your content of how you clone it, how you stamp it, where you do it, and in case you opt out, you don't want it, or potentially you wanna do anything else to it. You wanna put on an adjustment layer to it. You wanna rotate it, right? You can do all kinds of different things to this thing right here as a result of putting it on its own layer. So practice that up and then we'll move on to a few introduction lessons on filters and we'll close up. Enjoy, have fun. We're now gonna transition into the topic of filters. There are a zillion filters and a zillion different ways to use filters. So we're gonna start off kind of slowly and then just introduce you to a handful of them. So the first thing I wanna talk about with filters is the need to apply what we call a smart filter. So if I now convert this to a smart filter, you're gonna see it says to enable re-editable smart filters, the selected layer will be converted into a smart object. Earlier in this class, we talked about smart objects. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And you're gonna see that this is now a smart object. So if you recall, this now has this nice little protective sheath on there. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just undo that for a second. Right click on it, I want you to see there's another way to do this to say convert to smart object. Whenever you work with a layer that you're gonna have a filter on it, you wanna almost 99.9% .9 make it into a smart object or also known as a smart filter. Why do we wanna do that? 
We want to do it because we want to be able to protect the original layer so then that way we can manipulate the filter separate from the original layer. You're going to see what I mean by that, but that's going to be the first thing you want to do, so take note of that. So let's now just apply something to this. In other words, let's put a filter on it. So our filters are going to live up here. So what I'm going to do is simply click on that. I'm going to go over here to my filter gallery, and you're going to see if you have a smartphone or if you had a smartphone in the last you know, five years or so. Essentially, they're very similar to that, but they go even further. So I'm just going to go in and just zoom in so we can see the entire image here. And you will notice that we have different categories of all these filters that we can do. Fantastic. Of course, you can go all day looking at these, but let me just go ahead and do a paint daub or a poster edge. Okay, that's kind of nice. Let's just try cross hatch. Okay, maybe some things more than others. Okay, that's great. Now I'll come back to my paint daub or my poster edge. Okay, actually, I actually kind of like that one the best, but certainly experiment on your own. Now, I love this, but let's see what other options I can do with this. Now, you'll notice that on the right-hand side, I have all these different options. Almost all of these will give you different parameters and different kind of degrees you can explore each of these individual filters. So edge thickness, yep, that does exactly what I hoped it to do. Nice and thick, looks a little bit more like a kind of a cartoonish sort of comic book, okay, edge intensity, okay? And you'll notice how it actually does a little bit more than I'd like it to do on the outside. We'll fix that. Posterization, even more cartoony. All right, so how could we kind of play around with that a little more? How can we kind of nuance this a little bit? So let's click OK. And you can see, pretty good. I like that, not too bad. But now let's play around with the ability to do, guess what? Masking, 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 masking. So I want to turn my blindfold into a mask. So how do I do that? You guessed it, black and white and a brush. So I want to maybe remove some of this. I want to have a little more tempered control over it. So I'm going to go back to my brush, hit the B key, and then notice here is my black. That's going to poke a hole through my blindfold to make a mask. So I don't necessarily want all that. I really overdid it so I can get rid of that. Okay, see, I have all the control in the world on this. Come a little closer, maybe not super close, not that much of a shave. And of course, I can control this brush in terms of the hardness. I can control it in terms of the opacity. And eventually, I'll have exactly what I want. Right? Of course, I can come directly onto the document as well if you want a little more of a clean little image there. And then if I'd like to come back to the original filter, I can very, very easily do that just by coming right back over to here to my little filter gallery option there. I double click on that and that takes me right back to where I started from. Let's bring that back. Cool. And then I can play around with my edge thickness, etc. even change the filter if I want to. Super easy. So what I encourage you to do is take your image, whatever you've got, go into your filter gallery and play around with it. But once again, I want to encourage you to make sure the first thing you do is convert it to a smart object because guess what? I can always remove that anytime I want. See that? I can bring it back to its original form or remove it anytime because it's not on the original image. If I didn't have this smart object, then it would do it directly on the pixels and I would not be able to reverse it. I wouldn't be able to control it with a mask. Okay, so very, very, very important to make sure you convert this to a smart object ahead of time. So go ahead and practice that. See you in a bit. Continuing on with our discussion about filters, let's now talk about one of the more popular filters available, and that's around blurring. And there are a number of different types of blur filters you can do. Gaussian blur, radial blur, motion blur, and there's also the field blur. And the blurring tool options have really evolved over time to make it much easier for you to create what you want to create and really kind of manipulate certain parts and not affect other parts. Now we know there's a few other ways to do that by applying the smart object 
to your image here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that first. Remember, because this is going to be a filter. So of course, we want to do that before we do anything at all. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what our options are. We're going to go over here to our filter menu and we're going to see that we have a blur option here and we also have another blur gallery option here. So you'll see that we have blur and we have a number of different just kind of like generic blurs. We have a Gaussian blur, which is a very popular one. A lot of people use that one. Motion blur, like I said, kind of create the illusion that things are moving. Radial blur kind of makes it more of a round blur, like you can kind of do that for like a wheel, kind of make the wheels in motion. You'll see that a lot of advertisers do that, kind of give that illusion. Okay, and you can see there's a number of other ones here that you want to experiment with. Let's go over to here to the blur gallery. And what we're going to focus on here is the field blur. And you're going to see that this gives us so much control. And in this case, we're going to create something known as depth of field in photography. So maybe you want to have something to have a depth of field, but you didn't get a chance to do it with your photography, with the photo that you took. And that creates the illusion of depth, right? It creates the illusion of depth by making the foreground in focus while the background stays out of focus, okay? So it's a nice sort of like visual effect for the audience. So let's go ahead and click on Field Blur. And right away, it takes me now to another window that everything gets blurred, okay? That's great. And I have this little circle in there that kind of shows me that, okay, bam, everything is now getting blurred. You'll also notice that my mouse now turns into a little pin with a plus sign, which allows me to guess what? Choose different parts that I want to be blurred. So first thing I'm gonna do is now move this over what I want to be blurred. So I can then click on this, click on another thing, and I want both of these things to be blurred by a certain degree, okay? But I don't want this one to be blurred. So what do I do? I also need to click on this. And guess what? You're going to see in the upper right, I'm going to have these little options over here for how much blur do I want for that particular object. So this particular object has 15. This has 15. This has 15. So for this one in the foreground, guess what I want that to be? Zero. Bring that down and watch this. Amazing. Right away, you see that effect. So what I'd like to do is make it so the thing in the far, far background has maybe the most amount of blur. So let's bring that up to about 20. Why not? Let's go crazy with it. Okay, and this one, let's bring that down a tiny bit. Okay, a little more subtle. Okay, so you can see, all right, it really gives that illusion of depth. So I'm done with this. This looks amazing. I click OK. And here is my document. Looks fantastic. Love this, love this. Now, because I had this as a smart object earlier and I applied my filter, you'll notice here I now have this great little mask. Okay, so every time, every, every time you create some type of filter, make sure you make it into a smart object because guess what? Now I can manipulate this if I want to. All right, so before we actually start playing around with our mask again, let's see how we can go back into our blur gallery and then change this. Maybe this is a little bit too blurry. So very simply, double click on this blur gallery option there, and I can click right back on here. I'm just gonna make that a tad bit less blurry, bring that up to maybe 19 or 20, something like that. Sometimes it's easier just to type it in. Thank you very much. That's great, love that. Click OK. And then just as a reminder, if I would like to then just manipulate part of the image, so let's just say the stuff around the pair, I don't want that to be blurry, I can do that, again, using my mask, accessing the brush tool, making sure that I have black as my foreground color because I'm gonna make my blindfold into a mask, okay? Remember that. So you can see it's a little bit blurry here, but guess what? I can clean that up a little bit. Say, okay, great. I want the floor to come in a little bit more in focus, all that to be in focus. Maybe it's spilled over into here. Great. I have control over that. Okay, so it's just really the pair that I want to have out of focus. And you'll see here on my mask is now black to make my blindfold turn into a mask. You can see right through it. All right, so practice this. Practice this with all these other 
filters that you that I introduce you to. Have fun with it. Go crazy. And uh, we'll see you in the next exercise. Enjoy. Okay, and for our final set of exercises, now that we know a little bit more about Photoshop, we may want to control our preferences. We may want to show things how they want to be shown by you, and you might want to really sort of get under the hood a little bit. Now, your preferences are going to be buried pretty deep in there, and it's going to be a little bit different for your Mac versus your PC people. So if you are on the PC, you simply click on Edit, and you come down here to Preferences, and it's gonna pop up right over here. If you're on the Mac, you're gonna see there's gonna be a little Photoshop menu right there, and it's gonna say Preferences, and just go ahead and open it up just the same way. So let's now just go directly to our interface here. And the first thing we're going to be looking at to be able to make some changes to, very simply, is going to be our color scheme. You may want to manipulate this in a very different way, depending on your eyes, depending on your screen, depending on whatever your preference is, whatever your mood is for that day, you can absolutely do that. Okay, so just check that out. Just know that you do have that option to be able to just manipulate that. Okay, some other ones you might wanna do, let's go to our workspace. And you can see that you know, we focused quite a bit on our workspace in the beginning. So you can see how you can change these things to auto collapse your icon panel. So the icon panel is the one that was on the right hand side, the kind of the small, small narrow one. So you can choose to auto collapse that when you are not using it. So you click on it, you don't want it anymore. You can auto collapse that and just make it go away anytime you want. Okay, and you can also choose some of these things here in terms of open your documents as tabs, or maybe you don't want that. Maybe you wanna have them open up as individual windows if you like. You can also make your tabs a little smaller if you don't want those as well, okay? Another one that I want you to focus on is this one called file handling. And this is a really important one because Photoshop can and probably will crash. So this is a really kind of important one that you will thank me for at some point, which is this automatically save recovery information Okay, after how long? So basically, when and if Photoshop does crash, you will see that it will be saving how many minutes ago. So if I click on this, maybe you want it to be saving every five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. I like to have mine at five minutes because if it does crash, at least like there's that much more that it's going to be saving, okay? So just keep that in mind. Now, the reason why you may not want to do that, because it does use up some processing power, it will use up your RAM, could use up your memory and your temp files. And if things get too clogged up, it may slow you down. It may slow down your computer as a whole. So just keep that in mind. It just depends on the speed of your computer. Okay. And then let's just take a look at maybe one or two more. Let's go over here to your units and measure. What is going to be your default? What do you want your default ruler to show? Do you want it to be pixels, inches, maybe something else, else that you're working with, you can change all this stuff here. Okay, you can change all, also for type. What are you kind of communicating in? And you'll also see here for new document for your presets, for print, you can see here it's 300 for your screen resolution for web is 72. You can change all that if you have a very different profile that you're working from, you can absolutely do that. Now I encourage you just to go throughout all these different preferences you're going to find one that ones that jump out at you that are going to be a little bit more interesting, a little bit more kind of, you know, evocative in terms of what you're going to be working with, a little more meaningful. So experiment with them, see what what jumps out at you and then um yeah, empower yourself with whatever kind of changes you can make. Okay? So excellent. Thank you. I'm going to close out of this and just say one last thing about your preferences. I would recommend that when you're doing your preferences, make sure you have no documents open at all because Photoshop may get confused that, that you only want to do your preferences for that particular document. When you have nothing open, the preferences are for all documents, okay? So just a nice little tip there in case things aren't working consistently, just make sure that no documents are open as you do this, okay? Enjoy, and we'll see you in the next exercise. And by the way, please check out our other um, Adobe Photoshop advanced class once you're done with this. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our intro to Photoshop class. 
We've covered a lot of great tools and tips in this class, including drawing shapes, color theory, adjustment layers, masking, filters, layer effects, and so much more. Now remember, you have the exercise files to practice on, and I encourage you to watch this video as often as you need to and continue to learn, grow, and create. And please check out our advanced Photoshop video to learn even more. Thank you again. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.